Well, thanks for coming. Um, yeah, had a few people pull out, growers pull out today, obviously, because the traffic issues are flaring. Um, obviously, all of you people are so well equipped to have other people working and doing the work for you, so well done for that. Uh, and also, unfortunately, we had um, Vinay Page, who is a presenter from Adelaide University. He was going to be presenting on, on stress mitigation, but he had to pull out to unforeseen circumstances, so we'll present it down, but we'll have to get Toby um, from DEO... DE Aussie. DE Aussie. Um, they've actually got a, it's a diametrous earth product, which um, it can be used where thinking for, um, particularly for planting, but it's a great water retention product, which would be really, um, really good to look at uh, in the future. Plus, if we can work out a, a really good way for undervine application as well. Um, to retain in mushy compost as well, well so retain soil moisture and also nutrients would be really really worth looking at so we'll, um, we'll get Toby up first up to have a crack and, and go from there. Yep, thanks Toby. Thank you. Right, firstly good morning everyone. Um, and thanks to FBA for giving us the opportunity. I'm a bit of a late fill-in, so I've uh, had limited opportunity to sort of prepare, but I hope I can sort of um, make it clear to you guys what we're all about and what we're trying to present to you. So what we're talking about is our diatomaceous surf in a granular form at between a 5 to 15 mil. Um, and you're going to be uh, putting that into your soil to retain your moisture basically and work alongside everything else that you're currently putting in. So thanks Jock if you want to pass it around give everyone a look at it. So what is it exactly? Yeah so diatomaceous earth um, is basically the fossilised remains of um, an aquatic organism. So they're a diatom and they used to set in lake sediments for millions of years and they just basically lay it down. It comes along it gets mined out and then graded dried and it's been put through a process of um, screening to get it to that size. That has also been specially kiln fired to us and it's a very correct temperature so it can allow the greatest amount of absorption but also the retention of that water as well so it's not just filtering out so that has had a fair bit of time spent on that to be correct. Um, there is other levels of diatomaceous earth that did used to get used and probably still does get used in wine and beer filtration as well. In a powderised form, you guys may be familiar with that. Um, but our product is really sort of aligned around soil conditioning. I am just going to read a little bit off of here, guys, just so I make sure that we get everything accurate, if you're happy with that. So it is best recommended as a soil conditioner. Amendment improving aeration and the retention in your soils. It is primarily made up of a pure silica. Uh, it is from a freshwater deposit. Um, it's organic, non-toxic, environmentally friendly. Um, the porous structure of the diatom support the ability to draw moisture in, move water and oxygen laterally through the root zone and through the soil as well. Um, it does have a high cation exchange ratio as well. It does have a negative charge, so it will pull any positive charge ions towards it. Um, so you can recycle them. And I think the main thing that I really sort of want to emphasize is that once you put it into the earth, it will stay there, unless you physically um, degrade it down. It will stay there indefinitely, basically. So. Um, you may look to reapply after several years, depending on if you need to put more in, based on your drought tolerance of the soil. But I think that is an important factor. Um, so they are compatible with other soil amendments or nutrients. Um, the fact that it is pH neutral um, is completely chemical free. Um, so it will take on the uh, appearance of whatever it is you're trying to adjust the soil to do, basically. Um, so if you're using it in heavy clay soils, you're going to reduce the compaction ratio. Um, and I need to get myself a bit more familiar, and you guys might be able to help me with what sort of soils that you have around here. But if you have like a sandy soil, 
you're going to retain that moisture and obviously in a clay sort of base soil you're going to stop the compaction and allow um, oxygen to get deeper into the root zone as well. So from our research it will revitalise your soil um, and give your plants a great opportunity to be healthier overall. Um, basically because you've got more oxygen, more nutrient and more moisture retention at the soil level uh, and you're basically not going to put such a chemical footprint um, as potentially other products that you may be using. So I think that is something to consider as well. <coughs> and just going through the key points now and then I'd like to open up to any questions and talk about how it's going to be potentially used in your guys' uh, line of work. So it'll increase your water efficiency. Um, I have been speaking with the guys at FBA and they did sort of address the fact that last season as we hit that really hot spell, um, people were losing quite a lot of their asset and they just couldn't keep up with the watering. So I think that's where this is going to be a real advantage is sowing it into your soil with ripping or as uh, Jock was just suggesting potentially through mushroom compost as well um, to retain that moisture in there for longer. Um, it will also act as a thermal barrier when it's in that soil. So you freeze thaw during the winter or also when we get that really sort of hot spell it's going to retain um, a very stable temperature basically. So obviously then you're going to be delaying the wilting in drought conditions. It will increase the availability of nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. As I've stated, it will resist compaction, maximise your air and water in the soil. It will increase infiltration. It is amazing, we've been testing it even on tomato plants as well. And when you put it into the soil and you water the control um, plants at sort of 10% ratio versus one without the DE and you can just watch it just instantly just disappear the water will not pull it just gets drawn straight into the soil um, and you can physically see that happening straight away so it, it really does act like a sponge for moisture and there's 90 to 95% of that moisture can be then drawn back out to the plants as they require it so I think that is certainly going to be something that um, we need to be considering if we're going to put it into our soil as well. It will improve your drainage, um, especially if you've got compaction happening you know, through the winter months or if you've got that clay soil. It is definitely going to improve your drainage. It's going to help breathe, it's stopping that compaction as I've stated. Um, yeah, I guess what I did want to show you guys with that sample there, if I can have that back, and I'll pass it around. So as we apply water to it, what you're going to do is you're going to hear the oxygen and the water being drawn through the DE. Always want to pass it around, you can actually hear it breathing. Like cocoa pops. It literally is, yeah. Very crunch. Will they swell up or? They don't swell. No. Really. Yeah, absolutely won't swell at all. So there's millions of microscopic pores inside of the diatoms, and um, they're all equal size. So is there like a. Um like a surface area of volume, obviously all, all particles have a surface area of volume ratio and a smaller mm, particle the biggest surface area of volume ratio it has. So a small particle will have to absorb more of more water. Like if you were to have this in, in, in like a... Like a pool size? Yeah, 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 exactly. Like with that, that you could... So if someone wanted to, to dress something over the top of their yep. soil, like under vine, yep. you know, so underneath their dribble line, um, in that sort of size, can that, um, that can hold more water? So, um, from what 
we've found with our research is that anything from five millimetres and above is the best ratio for retaining the most amount of moisture. Uh, moisture. You know, anywhere up to sort of 72 hours and beyond, depending on the depth in the soil. We do have, as AJ was just talking about, we do have it in a prill size as well, which is 0.5 to 1.5, which certainly could be added topically to the surface of your plots as well. Um, and that is going to act absolutely like a sponge as well, but for long-term retention, anything above five mil, that's why we've chosen that five to 15 mil, seems to be the greatest. Once you sort of go above 20 mil, there's not really any real advantage from what we've found as to holding any more moisture. Um, so does it need to be incorporated or if you put it on the surface of the which you can with the smaller particles? Yeah, that's right. So it does need to be, I, I would imagine you'd want to have it ripped in. So. I'm just going to be honest, my experience is not from the viticulture, so we've obviously identified an opportunity after speaking with these guys. We know that in hydroponic growing is an absolute asset, so they love it. They use sort of 40% ratio of it in there um, and have really got some fantastic results out of it. So after speaking with Anthony and the guys at FPAG, they've identified that there was a problem over the last few seasons with drought and the high heat. That's why we've sort of introduced this, and I'd love to answer any questions if anyone's got anything that they'd like to know. What's the answer about the density of the product? Uh, it's, I don't have that exact figure, but it's basically close to sawdust is, is the closest sort of ratio, yeah. So it is very light. Um, a little bit, as you'll be able to see, will certainly go a, a hell of a long way. So is it made mostly in hydroponics up to this point? Yeah, it has been certainly used a lot in hydroponics um, and it's also been used in the US PGA. Um, it has been allowed through all their golf courses over there in the US. So a lot of the research that we've basically been done has been followed up from them. Um, it gets used in that. They use it in rooftop uh, growing, etc. Um, and also, in for your lawn and turf guys as well so I can't see why it wouldn't be a fantastic asset to be used in your vineyards as well. So what sort of cost is it like you're saying they have been lawn how much are they putting out for a particular area and what the cost of that? So the best ratio that we've found is starting at about 10% per volume so um, and it just depends on what sort of ratio of land that you want to fill after that but at 10 percent is a great starting point uh, as far as the cost i have been speaking with aj and jock and they'll be able to certainly answer those questions for you guys because we'd like to deal directly through them um, and they've offered obviously a chance to come up here and present the product and we can certainly get some samples out to you guys if you'd like to know a little bit more or have a play around with it we haven't had the opportunity to screw with the floor yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> They've been too busy screwing me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Have a chat to Russell and find out how much pain you can Yeah. So, so big fella, to, to, for, for someone to put their toe in the water. Yeah. What would you or AJ? What would you uh, What would you suggest? Would be the uh, is that infield trial looking at different rates of rate sensitive? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to have a crack at. Um, I mean, at this point. A little bit of banding on the bottom of the fire, yeah. Yeah. the fire pot, just to, just to see what it does. And just, just being at this end of the season, there's yeah, two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm hoping it's something great to put it in the fire and then I'm just putting the plants in. Mm -hmm. um, that would be awesome. I know Timmy, you guys did some pretty good seeding. Yeah, yeah. 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 So we've got it in 20 kilo sacks. Yeah. Um, now, as as far as putting in at that 10% ratio, basically sort of going back to what you were saying, you might be able to apply it similar to gypsum. You might be able to get away with a hell of a lot less as well, because as you can see, it'll hold between sort of 100 to 145% of its own body weight and moisture, and it will retain that for a hell of a long time. Even the zeolites will only hold about 50%. Um, and I'd encourage you guys to do, do a bit of your own research if you are interested as well. Like I'm just talking about something that has been around for a long time and we've identified an opportunity in the marketplace. 
Um, we have spent a fair bit of time getting that product right. So if it does get, I guess, calcined too far, the water will go in, but then it will come back out. And if you just have a completely raw diatomite particle, it will break down a lot. So it has been refined right to the sort of the right style that you need to have good retention of water as well as not break down. Pardon my ignorance, but how is the water released? Yeah, just through capillary action. Is it? Yeah. Just yeah, that's right. So the soil will pull that back Probably out as out. it requires, right. and the roots will naturally pull it out as well. Um, it's certainly not going to create like a, a lazy root system either as well um, because the roots are always going to be naturally going and looking for the moisture but when they do need to harness it they're going to get a I guess a moisture that is temperature stable and also it's going to be nutrient and the pH and everything is going to be consistent inside of that structure as well. <coughs> so if you put that out when you were doing a cover crop yeah. down your mineral yeah. You could put that out and it would still be there five years later? Absolutely, yeah. So its melting point is about 1500 degrees, to give you an example. Mm -hmm. So, got that here last year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it certainly will stay there. To give you an example, it's millions of years old as it is, to be honest. So, um, and if you were putting it topically, the other advantage is it's going to act as a thermal barrier. So. The product gets used in kilns and everything like that um, to stop the heat transfer from the outside to in. So it's certainly got some fantastic properties like that. If you were to use it topically, obviously everything below that is going to be stable as far as temperature as well. Is there any questions, guys? Any other interest? Yeah, how big is a 20 kilo bag? I've got one in the van, I, I can happily bring that up. So it's about sort of 90 centimetres by about 45. So that's why they employed you. That's right, yeah, one on each arm. Yeah. <laughs> so you do it in, a, in bulk or in a bulk bag or in uh, 20 kilo bags? For ourselves and our business model, um, the 20 kilo bag uh, works well in a bulk, I guess, environment for, for us to handle. Um, we also will reproduce that down for the retail market into 10 kilo bags. Um, but at this stage, we're probably sort of not going down the bulk bag sort of path. And I'm assuming that you would probably fill it into a hopper and then drive it out. I'd need a little bit of education there as to how, how you might apply it. Yeah. A disc seeder if it's going down the line, right? Because yeah. yeah. we're, we're a new business and we need to be versatile. Um, a 20 kilo sack gives us greater flexibility with our sort of business model. If it was something that down the track, you know, it works really well for you guys and you need it in that size, well, we'd certainly work alongside of what if the requirements you, are. If you put 10 kilos of that in yep. a concrete mixer and let it run for 24 hours, would it disappear into the fine print or would it still stay as it? Uh, this is a great question. I, I haven't actually I I've done that one. I haven't tested that one yet. I can only answer yeah, honestly. Um, so could you put it out in the mouse spreader, that small... Would that be yeah, like a smell base spreader? Like a smell base spreader? In the prill size? Yeah. What's the prill again? Yeah. How big's the prill? I, I can pass it around if you want, guys. So it's a 0 0.5 to 1.5. Oh, yeah. There go through. Yeah, That's yeah, it. Yeah. So we've targeted that for people obviously with lawn and turf to be able to put it in just their normal lawn and turf after they've aerated. That would last longer. I don't think so. Um, I, I, I strongly... Half a million years instead of Only through degradation, you know. Like anything at the top layer, I'm assuming there's going to be compaction of people walking across it um, just through high winds as well. Um, and, and obviously if you're driving tractors and that down, you're probably going to have more chance maybe to break that down. Um, but it will only break down with physical compaction, so it, it doesn't become soluble. So if it's down a vine row with a mushroom compost on the top, it's Absolutely, yep. So it, it's not going to break down unless there's physical intervention, basically. Yeah. And um, no, no dust worries if you're handling it at all? Yeah, so 
what, what we'd recommend if you were handling it in a bulk amount is probably just like a mask. Yeah. So there's less than 1% crystalline silica in our products. Um, so I would handle it like you would anything uh, by just with soil. It's always best to be safe, not sorry. Um, at worst, it's probably going to be an irritant to your lungs. If you were working around it, you know, 24-7, you, you may sort of uh, potentially get more of a, um, I guess, a lung um, irritant or infection. Um, but I would just suggest wearing your mask, basically, as you're handling it. Because as you sort of are pouring the 20 kilo bag, it will have a fine, obviously, residual dust that will come up. I'd like to think that some of the compost that you guys are handling have probably got maybe far greater microbial problems that you wouldn't want going into your lungs anyway. So, with, um, so in the turf situation, yeah, okay. I'm sorry, you were saying they were more the water than they were broadcasting. Yeah. Um, in turf, they will use selective herbicides. Yeah. What's, does this absorb herbicides? And what's the, what, what happens when it does absorb a herbicide if it does absorb it? It will just retain it in its shell. Yeah, okay. That's right. So that's where it's uh, unique because it will be able to work alongside any other input that you are putting in to your plot as well. Yeah. Um, it, it, so the best way of describing it is an absorber, basically, um, and it will retain whatever you put into it. Um, so are you considering what the the effects like year after year yeah, yeah, of it? Exactly. Yeah. Continue to build up. So I broken down the moisture though, I don't. So, no doubt that herbicides and, and everything else is sort of being, I guess, created these days to not have such a long-lasting effect. Would that be fair to say? Is the impact in the earth? Yeah. So if you, for example, you could put stomp out and it'll last a lot longer. Yeah, the uh, the oh, stick to your cement mixer idea, I think. Right? <laughs> so, uh, when they've done like basically revegetation, um, as far as like roadside, where well, there's not going to be any, uh, I guess, council rewatering and things like that, and the survival rate of some of those natural trees and fauna may be 25 to 30 percent. Um, they've used DE. Uh, in a state in Illinois in America and their survival rate became 75 to 90 percent just using the natural rainfall so they tested that from one side to the other which I thought was um, a pretty sort of phenomenal figure and it just proves the retention rate that it has when it is in there so I'm thinking you may and I can't say this factually um, it would be interesting to troll this to be able to reduce your irrigation would you have a lock up? Right per plant, if you put them in, say, new vines, so you can use a bigger piece, the bigger size, and you might you know, put in a cup full or three bigger pieces per vine or something like that. Do you have a. Oh, look, like 10, 10, grams, 10 grams per kilo of soil is, is a great okay. sort of starting point. Yeah. Um, yeah. G'day. Yeah, man. yeah I, I've, with vines, and I'll be honest, it's That's not my sense. complete background. You guys would obviously know your plants uh, far better than anyone and you would have potentially a much greater feeling of um, what they are truly going to like. It's something that I do um, want to get myself more up to speed with obviously if we start entering into your marketplace and uh, would love all the feedback and any education that you want to sort of throw our way. So has anybody worked out that if you have a kilogram of these that it holds 100 mils of water or 200 mils of water? Is it does anybody know their water holding capacity? It will hold its yeah. weight yeah. in water, but probably closer to about 120 up to 140 percent of itself in water. So it's a kilogram of water per, so a litre of water for each kilogram. It would be certainly very close to that, yeah. And it will take time to absorb that all in, but once it's absorbed that and it, it can't hold any more, it will release obviously the rest of that water out. So if you were putting it into your crop as well, it's not just going to suck all the water in, then the roots have to fight for that. It will only hold what it can hold. Um, That's just like a long ground reservoir, It truly is, absolutely. Um, yeah. Guys, have you guys got any interest or questions thinking about it moving forward? Um, you'd be able to work with us to do some trial work for this so that we can.
take the next step forward? Yeah, we can certainly have a chat on that, absolutely. Um, that's certainly something that we can talk about. Yep. All right, guys. Well, I'm probably just about Thanks. wrapped up. Thanks. Done well. Thanks for listening. Straight off the bench without any training. Uh, uh, yeah, pack, me, pack me footy boots and just Mate, roll in. You get a gear for the <laughs> pros. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks, Toby. That is pretty interesting stuff. And yeah, honestly, if anyone has any interest in just having a crack at this, if you're doing some plants and you think, well, let's just get a little bit of product just to have a look at, we're absolutely willing to, um, yeah, to work with some growers on yeah, get, getting something into your grounds. We can actually work out um, the best rates and the best way to use it. So. Um, yeah, so any questions, Toby's going to be here for a little bit, so yeah, yeah we'll just hit him up. Uh, yeah, feel free to get a cup of tea or coffee straight away. Pretty, pretty nice day out here. Okay. Oh, Jock. <laughs> I got told to do that, I wouldn't do that, I would respect my orders. <laughs> So, so yeah, it's um yeah, so I'm from Omnia. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of us or not. Um, we uh, we do a number of things, but I guess in the in the viticulture world, our our brand's probably known from uh, green seal actually, which is the only chemical that we actually well, that and gel seal, the, the only chemicals that we actually produce. So um, primarily, we're a crop nutrition company. Um, and, and we specialise in certain things, uh, so we, we don't try and be everything to every, everyone, but uh, we've got some pretty good stuff that seems to be pretty well uh, used and, and, uh, and uh, quite, quite successful for us. But, so basically, I'll just, just give you a little bit of a rundown of our company for two minutes, just to, I guess, build a bit of um, um, branding, really, it's, it's, which is really important what we do. Uh, so our company's, uh, the parent company's South African. Uh, we started about 60 odd years ago uh, as a lime spreading company over in South Africa in, in the maize triangle, which is, I guess, um, in Africa, maize is their, their primary staple crop, so it's a pretty, pretty big business for us. Um, and then we just evolved into a little bit of mining arm and a, and a chemicals arm as well. So we fit into the agricultural component in the middle. Um, and then in Australia, we started, we, I guess, in, in the 90s, we, uh, the, the company, the, the management, uh, realised that there's going to, the, the future of, of, of agriculture in terms of crop nutrition is um, uh, in, in, the, in the biostimulant section. So uh, in, in South Africa, we're, we're a compound fertiliser company, so we're kind of like a, an IPL, I guess, over there. But, um, from a development point of view and a, and, a, and a growth, we had to expand. So it was determined that um, the coal mines in Victoria is, is the, uh, in, in Gippsland there, that's the, 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 the duck's nuts of, of, um, of raw materials to produce humic acids, um, which, is, which I'll explain a little bit more about as to why it's good stuff. But um, um, so the company acquired it. An Australian company called HRI, and then we started here in South in, in Australia. So we now export to 30 odd different countries. Um, actually, exports our our biggest market, um, and and a lot of that's actually in fertilizer coating. So the guys at FPA actually they have a coating set up where they actually use our, our products for coating as well as other things. So a lot of their fertilizers have that, which I, again I'll explain the, the benefits. So. So what I'm really here to talk to you today about is, is, is biostimulants um, and what they are and, and, and why they work and, and how they work. And uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a soil biologist, I'm an agronomist, so um, I'm not an expert in microbiology, but I do have a pretty good understanding as to, um, as, as to why these things work and I've got some pretty good people around me that have, that have trained me up, I guess. So, I'll just read this part because it's it's taken from a um, I guess the, the world 
um, biostimulant body, I guess. So, and this is taken from um, um, peer-reviewed peer journals. So biostimulants foster plant growth and develop and development throughout the crop life cycle from seed germination to plant maturity in a number of demonstrated ways including but not limited to uh, improving the efficiency of the plant's metabolism to induce yield increases and enhance crop quality, increase plant tolerance and recovery from abiotic stresses, facilitating nutrient assimilation, translocation and use, um, enhancing quality attributes of produce including sugar content, colour, fruit, seed, fruit seeding, etc., and rendering water use more efficient. Enhancing physio... physio this is another, I think that should be a... Um, it's the wrong way. You know, physiochemical properties of the soil and fostering the development of complementary soil microorganisms. microorganisms. So, there's a lot of words there, um, but essentially I've put that slide up just to show that this is not... Um, something that I've made up. Um, it's, there's a bit of a bit of science behind it because it's a, there's a world of of um, snake oil, which I'll get into in a second. Um, so they operate through a, a number of different mechanisms. I'll just probably probably easy if I just go. To um, so basically, uh, the ones I'm going to talk to you today about are humic acids and fulvic acids um, and seaweed ex extracts. Okay, if we have a moment, if we have time, I'll talk a little bit about. A, a biological inoculant that we have, um, but that's not my, my focus today. It's really to get a bit of an understanding about humics and fulvics. So, um, actually, I'll ask: do, do you guys, do, do any of you guys use any of these types of biostimulants or products? That you know, yeah, humic that goes out. Yeah. Quite often, yeah. 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 <coughs> and also, uh, kelp is used a lot too. Yeah. Right. And and. Um, and so you understand the, the differences, or this is, this is helpful if I can sort of explain it, if you've ever wondered what the differences are between humics and fulvics. So this will be very helpful. Yep, yep, yep. Really. All right, good. That's the goal. So, so basically, this, the global market, so this is why we've, we've invested a lot of time and money into, into this market, and, that, and that's because it is, it is the, the, the future, right, basically, of, of crop nutrition. I'm not sure if you've seen this, this picture, but Essentially, the world of, in crop nutrition is, is all about balance, right? So you've got your physical, chemical, and biological properties. The physical and chemical properties are, are quite well known in agriculture. So chemical is, is really, in a nutshell, fertilizers, okay? So we all know about urea and potassium and nitrogen and phosphorus, all that sort of stuff. Um, physical is soil structure um, and the biological component as you can see, it's just as important as anything, but it, it's, it's, it's an unknown world. So, so many companies are investing into this, into this market because it is, it is a, um, it's a growth area. So, um, so I guess that's, that's where the money is. So, so I just thought I'd talk to you, give you a bit of an explanation about snake oil though, right? Because quite often these things get put into the category of snake oils, which is a fair, fair um, assumption because it's an unregulated market and, and unfortunately we don't have any, any standards as to say quality has to meet this regulation or whatever. Chemicals do, um, that, um, you know, you've got your APVMA registration, you've got um, all sorts of things. So essentially snake oil is actually a real thing that works believe it or not. So back in the day, um, the Chinese water snake was, had, a, had a lot of um, additional benefits. So, so basically, uh, a, a, an entrepreneur in, in the 1800s from, from America saw this and he thought, hey, I can make a few bucks out of this. So he went over and he found out about it and he came back and he went, went around and he started, he made his own brew up that actually contained no, no snake oil and he started flogging it off. and. Uh, and obviously it didn't have the same, you know, curing factors that real snake oil has. So, snake oil actually works, believe it or not. The real stuff works, but it's the copy stuff, it's the stuff that's, um, you know, made up. And that's how that name, that's how that came. And interesting, I found this last point quite interesting, that quite often the, um, the copycats actually put um, amphetamines or alcohol in there in their medicines, so, so they got some sort of benefit um, 
which is probably no different to a to a biological product that's got nitrogen in it or something like that, just to give you a bit of a quick response so people go, hey, this is pretty really good stuff. But um, so, do many? Do you guys know? Does anyone know much about the carbon cycle? Have you heard of the carbon cycle or anything like that? It's probably something all those people, all those uh, students and what's that, like Greta, Greta Bird or something should probably learn a little bit about when they're, when they're out, you know, causing all their problems out protesting because it's actually probably the key to, uh, you know, all the, all the global issues, global warming issues and climatic factors that we're, we're on about. But anyway, I won't get, get on my high horse with that. The, the reason I put this up is, is, is just, just so you can see that plants, when, with carbon, right? So we all, we all know about carbon, we all know it's, hey, it's pretty good stuff and we're trying to get it in our soil and, and, and you know, it's going to do great stuff for us. But a lot of people don't actually understand uh, why, right? And this is, this is where humics start coming into it. Um, so basically, in nature, plants capture carbon from the atmosphere, right, and carbon dioxide. They fix carbon internally, that's, that's photosynthesis, and they produce sugar, okay? So carbon, carbon hydra, carbohydrates, it's like having a bowl of pasta, right? You, you, we eat sugar, they capture carbon from the atmosphere and, and make sugar themselves, okay? They then use that sugar for a number of different things. They use it for plant growth, right, to make fruit, to reproduce, all these other things, but a one third of the sugars that plants produce are actually uh, used to feed microbes in the rhizosphere. So, so basically, they capture it, they fix it, and then they excrete it through their roots uh, into the rhizosphere to feed uh, microbes and fungi. So, it's um, it's a pretty so, so nature understands the importance of, of uh, microbes and all this sort of thing, and 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 I think. Um, we're starting as people, we're starting to understand that it is actually a real thing we've got to, got to, got to um, start to learn more about. So, so it is there to feed microbes but also to, to mineralise, right? Min Mineralisation, um, that, that rhizosphere is, is the key to crop nutrition because it, it, it gets your pH right, it makes nutrients available, it unlocks nutrients, it does all these fantastic things. So. Um, so basically the first, the first thing, so the role of decomposition is to feed microbes, like I said, just said that. So what happens is, is these, these plants, these, the, the, the fungi, so the, have you heard of mycorrhizal fungi, right? So, so basically the best way to understand them is um, they take carbon from the plant and then they give the plant a phosphate, right? That's in, they trade in carbon and phosphates, it's an easy way to is way to get it. Then they grow, they go searching for more phosphates, it gives the roots an extended root system, right? It increases their surface area so they can find more water, um, gives it more area to, 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 to mineralise, the greater rhizosphere, and you have that, that flow on effect. So the plant is fixing carbon to feed microbes in that, in that rhizosphere, basically. And it's not just, it, so that's mycorrhizal fungi, but um, beneficial bacteria, for example, um, they, they, they form a symbiosis with, with, with roots as well. So if you have, um, if you have uh, some, some fungal diseases, in, in soil-borne fungal diseases, if you have a, um, like I just say, rhizotonia in the soil, right? And you've got a little rhizotonia bug running around and he's coming in to try and get into this, get into this nice carbon area, right, because there's all the plants putting out this carbon and it looks like there's a bit of a nice spot to hang out and get, get lots of food. Well, the good guys, the good guys who recognise they're getting the food from the, from the plant, they, they sit there and go, hang on a second, mate, oh, this, is, this is our area, you're coming in to, you know, to invade the roots and kill everything and, and, and exploit everything, we want to protect it. So, so that's, that's where you can get a bit of a, an antifungal type um, um, benefit from having a healthy root system because the symbiosis that the good guys have with the roots, they'll actually, um, they'll actually provide a form of protection, I guess. It's, um, 
So what have we got next? Uh, another important aspect about that rhizosphere um, would, would be organic acids that are coming out. So um, those carbon sugars, they're in the form of an organic acid. Sorry, I didn't explain that. Is, is they actually have a role in uh, like a metallic iron. Like if, you're, if, you have a, if you have a copper in the soil, like that's a heavy metal. That's, that's something plants don't like, right? But even though they need it, but they need to be converted into a form that a plant will accept it. Right, so, so organic acids are used to, to complex or, or, or chelate um, nutrients in the soil to make them accessible by the plant, so, which I'll get into as well. I'm just trying to give a bit of background information. Um, I'll talk about that. So our, our humic acids, so this is where it leads into to the, to, to humics, right? Well, one thing, our claim to fame in, 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 in this biostimulant world, um, and it, it is actually wide, quite widely, recognised in the industry is, is that our, our, our K-Humate is the, the purest product on the market. So, um, and I'll get into why as well. But essentially, as a summary of that, improved phosphate uptake, improved trace element available, availability and improved um, resistance to, to pathogens. And this is more background information. So, do you guys understand what an enzyme is? So, so basically, an enzyme, for a, for, a, for a reaction to happen, right? So, so when your plant is, or your crop, or your, your vine, or whatever, it doesn't matter. It's, it's even our own physiological um, processes. We need enzymes to, to facilitate a, a transaction to happen. So, so for a chemical reaction to happen, you need enzymes, right? So enzymes are usually in the form of proteins, okay, which are produced by microbes and that sort of thing. So, so basically, an easy an easy way to get this is so so when you put nitrogen down, so you need a substrate and an enzyme. I know it's quite deep stuff, but I'll try and give examples to to um, make a bit more understanding. So, so a substrate. When you put urea down, you you're putting a substrate. Urea is a substrate. When you you do not get value for that urea if you do not have the enzyme urease. You get that? So, so you need, it's like a lock and key, right? So just for the sake of a number, if you've got 100 urea down, if you've only got 50 ureas, you're only going to get value for 50 of your urea. That's it. Do you get that? Like it's, it's, it's just about the numbers I'm just plucking out of the air. But it's just, it's, it's, it's about, so, so when you start talking efficiencies, it's about trying to understand how these things actually work. So producing enzymes is a key component of, of, of microbes, I guess, um, and organic acids. So, humic acids. So I'll talk about humic acids, fulvic acids, and um, kelps, okay? And if there's time, I'll go, I'll go on to something else. But um, if you don't understand something, or you want me to explain something better, please just shout out. Um, it's, yeah, it's, as I said, there's no point in me talking, up, talking <laughs> over your heads or you're not understanding something if you're interested or come and see me after. So, so basically in soil, uh, we have a fraction that is organic matter, okay? So generally it's aimed to be 4%. I'm guessing it's probably a bit, bit lower around the place. Is that what, what are you guys sort of, about 2%? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yep, listen to. So, so anyway, so you've got a sandy soil, but whatever, you know, you, you get my point. There's a small fraction of, of the, of the, um, of the soil that is organic matter. Within that organic matter, there is, there is, I guess, components that make up organic matter. So, so carbon is one of them, um, and, and living biomass is, is another one. Within that carbon, so you see here you've got humus, an active fraction, okay, making up a pretty, significant component of your organic matter, okay? Only a part of that active fraction is what we're going to talk about today, okay? That's the soluble, that's the part that, that you'll get value from as a biostimulant. That's the part that, that, is, that is available, part of, well, or sorry, um, microbe available um, carbon. Okay, so and, and, I, and I'll, I'll get into this, but if, for example, if you have a if you have a, a a diamond, right? That's full of carbon. That's a carbon 
you know, compound. But you put that in the soil, it's not going to feed, it's not active. Like microbes aren't going to be able to feed off it, you know what I mean? So it needs to be in a form that, that they, can, they, can, um, they can get access to. So within soil, so then you've got, you've got soil organic matter and humus, which is the active, active and inactive fraction. Then you break it down. Humin is the insoluble, inactive component. Of, humi of humus, humic acids is soluble, and fulvic acid, okay, is soluble. Understand? So the humic and fulvic component of organic matter is the is the is the active carbon available form of of, um, of food, I guess, for for microbes to do their thing. So so basically. Um, uh, when plants are capturing carbon, right, and producing their organic acids and they're putting it into the soil to feed microbes, they're producing organic acids and, and a major, the major component of those organic acids are humic and fulvic acids, right? So they're, they're, they're doing that naturally. That's, that's, the, that's the plant's way of, of feeding um, the root zone and mineralizing and doing all that. So we're, we're just trying to cheat a little bit by, by doing, by making it a, a, I guess, a replication of that. It's a bit hard to see this one. So essentially, I'm trying to now build a bit of a picture about um, um, the differences between the two things and when, when you use them, I guess. So fulvic acid has a much lower molecular weight, has a much lower exchange capacity. And when I say exchange capacity, I mean the ability, the amount of charge that that the the the, the, the um, I guess the, the, the product has really that to, to bind to the nutrient. Okay, so it's got a lower charge than than um, than humic acid. Okay, um, and as you get start getting into different types of raw materials, the charge. Um, um, it, it increases, but it's unavailable. It's hard, it's hard to explain, but essentially the key components is you have a low molecular weight for a fulvic and a high molecular weight for the for the humic. What that means, fulvic are better on the leaf, and humics are better in the soil. Okay, so that's a key thing. Better on the leaf, better on the soil. Okay, so I'll explain why. So humic acids, just just as an overview, they increase cation exchange, so do you guys know what cation exchange is? So it's ba basically, it's the amount, it's the bucket size of how many cations your soil can hold. A cation is a nutrient that has a positive charge. Okay, so iron, so copper, zinc, iron, manganese, um, or potassium, calcium, magnesium, they are, they're all cations, okay? Because they have a positive charge. So your cation exchange capacity is how many of those nutrients your soil could hold, okay? Humic acid is not a silver bullet in terms of you put 20 litres of this down, it's not going to make your cation exchange go through the roof, but it, it works when you put it with fertilisers to help that fertiliser at the time. That's why coating is a really good thing because you can put it on the fur and you can, you can make sure you don't get leaching and you know, loss of it to the atmosphere and that sort of thing. So, it's, it's really it's more of a biostimulant, but it does have that cation exchange capacity benefit, I guess. Um, water retention, um, food source of microbes, which is my key selling point. Um, nutrient efficiency, so I talk about enzymes, right? So enzymes, you, you, you stimulate mi microbes, you have more protein production, all these things, all these things that produce enzymes, they facilitate um, um, the availability of these of these um, nutrients. So, in a in an organic soil, you're going to have more active carbon. You're going to have more microbes doing their thing. You're going to have more urease production, more phosphatase production, um, more glucose. About. So, all these different um, enzymes you're going to have in in, a, in an organic soil. So, all we are trying to say with humic acids. Uh, they're not a, it's, not a, it's not a product that I put 20 litres out a year and my organic matter is not going, going through the roof. It is about stimulating 
you know, like producing a feeding frenzy to, to get things happening at a, at a given time. You understand what I mean? So um, it's part of a it's part of a holistic system. I guess at the end of the day. So you still need to do all your fertilizer. You still need to do all, have your long term um, uh, uh, you know, soil health programs, all that sort of stuff. But this is just part of a, a bigger picture. I guess. Yeah, the lines, um, it's one of those things mentioned that trisomics being not very mobile. Yep. Yeah. The best way to get trisomics are on hot leaf. Yeah. Um, um, using humic acid, does that help to improve? If you need, if for whatever reason you want to or need to put out trisomics by like fertilization, mm -hmm. does humic acid assist in, um, not the uptake, but assist in the retention for uptake of the soil? For, for retention would be the best way to um, describe it because. And I'll actually explain that. I've got a, I've got a good slide um, in fulvic acids, yeah. fulvic actually, because a lot of products come with trace elements with fulvics, but if you're putting it in your soil, the only problem is if you're using a sulfate, um, because I don't know if you saw that slide back, um, humics are only alkaline soluble, so you can't generally mix a sulfate with a humic, you mix it with a fulvic because yeah. of compatibility. Um, but essentially, if you were to put one in, and then the other one, straight like put the humic, then the, you're producing all these these um, negative, you're, you're leaving at a given time, it has to be you know, perhaps one after the other, but you're, pr you're producing an environment where you've got charge to hold on to your, yeah. your, your copper or iron or, or zinc. Yeah. Um, so yes is the answer, because it's about, what, if, you have a, if you put a zinc down, right, or any cation, and it is exposed, if, depending on the pH of the soil, but if you higher or lower, generally or, higher, yeah. Yes. Yeah, higher so, to, to lower generally. Yeah. So if you have a higher pH, usually, usually it's um, it's the carbonates in the soil that will bind to the the zinc, and when it becomes zinc, so carbonate has a negative charge, a zinc has a positive. They bind together. You get zinc carbonate. That's not plant available. So plant, when you talk about mineralisation. When they're putting their organic acids into the soil, they're trying to break that bond. You need an you need an acid to to break the bond, right? Um, but essentially, but if you put your zinc out, put your humic and then the zinc, you're providing that cation exchange for the zinc to bind to the charge of the of the organic yep. the organic negative charge. So it's keeping it. It's actually then in that organic complex form. That the plant wants. Remember, I said you can't, plants can't take zinc up in a metallic form. They need to be changed so, so they're in a form that the plant can, can grab it. So you, you're putting it in a form that's actually readily plant available as well. So and, then, and you mentioned about the sulfates too. So let's say mm -hmm. there's some, let's talk about magnesium for example. So yeah. Magnesium sulfate, Epsom salts. Yeah. Um, so what, what sulfate? What effect do the sulfates have if you're putting out by fertilization? You can't mix. Sulfates, you can't because humic acid is an alkaline product, right? To make humic acid, and I'll show that in the next couple of slides, you have to you have to use a, a highly alkaline um, extracting mechanism, I guess, to, to, to pull it out. So then the, the then the, the end product is alkaline in nature. So if you mix it with a sulfate solution, the the the, the humic falls out, and yeah. then you put it through your drips and it'll block. So if you were doing it, if you wanted one product, fulvic acid is acid soluble as well. So that will mix with it with a magnesium sulfate or a um, or a uh, iron or whatever, iron, a sulfate based product. But if you mix it with a, um, um, if you're doing it, doing a humic, so if I were you, I would probably say humic, then you, then then um, um, like your sulfates, yeah. right? But magnesium is a funny example because magnesium you probably want to manage through the soil and through root flushing, but but copper zinc and manganese you just put it put it in your tank mixes, yeah. manage it like that because it's such a because magnesium you need quite a bit of to grow a crop, whereas copper zinc and manganese you can manage it with probably but um, anyway so you, yes it will help with that in a sandy. One is calcium penetration, so it's been shown that um, with with that, it's, everything's again about charge. So it's about um, acting like a, a conductor. Basically, you get the humic into the soil, and it, it actually works the same 
with nitrogen. A lot of people mix like um, UAN with, with humic acid. I think you guys do quite a bit of that at FPA, and um, and that's all about getting the getting the nutrient into the soil and um, less exposure to the to the atmosphere, basically. So so we're showing that you can get calcium deeper into your root zone. Um, um, and a sodium chloride buffer. So I'm talking about mineralization. So, so I'll, I'll just get into why. Okay, so, so, so they are good things. There's a bit of a misconception about when and how to use them, right? Because, it, like I said, a lot of people think, oh, if I put organic matter out, I want to improve my organic, organic matter. Like it, it doesn't really work like that. It's a pretty hard thing to, to change, and you need a lot of it, I guess, even composting, you put a you know, 10 ton of compost, that's not going to do a hell of a lot to your organic matter, um, but it's going to do some great things in terms of root flushing and microbes and all these other things that are going to help work. But now, I guess the humix is, is more about a, a, a part of a program that's, that's, like I said, holistic. So the differences in, in humic acids, and this is where it comes a little bit sticky, I guess, because there are a lot of products, a lot of companies that make a lot of claims, um, and and really, in, in without a, a, a standard, it's really difficult for um, for you guys as consumers to to comprehend why why this one's saying it's 20 26 percent potassium humate, and this one's saying it's 12, but that one's twice the price of that, and this and that. You're, you're trying to make logical decisions, and you and you and you. You know, it's it's kind of it's a difficult thing because there's a lot of different. You don't know who to believe or what to believe. So basically, that's where I'm going back to where we started. So we started on the back of, of of research, I guess, into into the different qualities of different different um, organic materials to be able to extract um, humic acids. Okay. So that's over in oil, it's called Leonardo. Leonardo is, is recognised as the as the bee's knees of, 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 of active carbon extraction, okay? And there's differently, there's European, there's American, there's Australian. So we say Australian's the best, but it's the youngest, right? I'll explain what that means. So but so, um, You can see, see here, just the different actual content of the raw materials, right? So it's quite a, quite a big difference. You look at hard black coal; it's zero percent humic acid, which is what a lot of people. So this is this is just some pictures of our of our coal mine. So we take it, we come in, we test the coal, right? We test it. We send that coal off to a, a, a lab in California, which is called the. Um, um, the uh, CDF, CDFA, ANL labs, they test under the CDFA method, which is a Californian um, Department of Forestry and Agriculture. Okay, so it's the standard, it's, it's regarded by the, the world humic acid body as the, as the standard for humic acids. However, you've got the Chinese standard, and you've got the Indonesian standard, and you've got all these different standards that, are, that people disagree with. You know what I mean? And we don't we don't have a standard in Australia, so we run with the American. Um, we, we just keep it consistent, and we believe in the in that that standard. So that's our our thing, okay? And that's because um, I'll explain that in a second. So, so basically, this is an interesting slide because I talk about Leonardo, right? We've got Leonardo, we've got brown, uh, brown coal and black coal. If you see up the top the oxygen content, okay, and hydrogen, but more so oxygen. Down here, a black coal, very little oxygen. It's good for burning because it burns a long time because not, it doesn't burn quickly and it can produce energy, yada yada yada. But the, the, the younger the coal, okay, the more oxygen. It's very, very important, very important thing. When you are a peat, Right, so you've got your trees, you've got your dead animals, you've got your organic material, they, they die, they fall into the soil and they start breaking down, okay? They become peat is the first stage. 
right? They've, they've become, uh, once they're sort of broken down in, in the soil. But they need to fossilise enough over you know, thousands of years to actually become um, a, a coal, right? So, so, so basically, Leonardite is the first stage of peat becoming a coal, okay? So that coal, that Leonardite, is the youngest stage of, of coal and contains the most oxygen out of any coal going around. So the Leonardo in Australia, we're very fortunate, it's the youngest in the world. It's the youngest coal in the world. Okay, so not so good for any of this, but beautiful for <coughs> extracting fulvic acids, which is, you know, I'm not going to sort of put Australia on the map, but it's, it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a very good thing for producing fulvic acids. So, remember I talked about the oxygen, right? These groups, these CWH, OH, all these groups, right? All of them, they're the ones that have a negative charge. They're the ones that produce the cation exchange component that produces benefit. Okay? You understand? See the carbon, the carbon sugars? See that? See how they're in the middle and they don't have anything around it? Microbes can get to it. It's easy. So it's got a great, the oxygen facility, it, it enables the cation exchange and the, and the structure of it is open so microbes can feed off of, off of the carbon. Does that make sense? It's, it took me a long time to get my head around this, so I hope I'm explaining it in a way that it's logical. That's what a humic acid looks like without oxygen. There's no, there's no points. There's no, none of that, the cap, there's none of those negative charges that can bind to the, the nutrient, right? So the negative charge is very important, okay? And the, and the openness of the structure because you need the microbes to be able to get to the carbon. There's no good the carbon being in, in the middle there where you can't, you can't get to it because it's, it's inactive. It's not, it's, that's, that's where I'm getting in with the active and inactive um, um, food sources. So, so basically, that's the difference between a, 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 a humic acid made from a high quality coal compared to one made from a from a black coal, right? Or a brown, even just even just a brown coal. A lot of people make theirs from um, um, a, a Bacchus marsh coal. Um, still good stuff, right? Um, it, it just doesn't have that higher higher um, um, quality, I guess. So the you know, purity. So we, we did, a, did some testing on the marketplace um, with all the different products that we could find um, independently. This wasn't us, but someone else did this. Um, they, they got all the different products that they could find, sent it over to California, and um, that's what they came back at. So this one is our gra a granular, right? A water-soluble one, and that's our liquid. Um, a couple of good ones in there still. And the, you can see down here, there's actually one that's not even on here that was 0.21 of 1%. So when you start talking about snake oils, right, if one of you guys have bought that product and you go out and put it out and it does nothing for you, you're going to go, this is just humic acid to shit. They don't work. You know what I mean? So it, it, makes, a, it makes a difference. Um, so that's our, our product. Um, FBA have a, have a bulk tank. Um, so they store it on site up here, so I think I do quite a bit of mixing with um, UAN, that's one of your key vineyard applications, isn't it, with your UAN? <coughs> so when you're doing that, one of the one the reason you're mixing with UAN is when, first of all, the, the biostimulant factor, but also for UAN to be effective, you, you, need to, you need to get it into the soil. Like, you don't want to lose the, the ammonium to the atmosphere, Okay, you want to um, you want to keep it, get it in the soil, and get it down into the root zone, and that's what I was talking about—that conducting factor with calcium. It's the same works the same way. So, and then also the biostimulant part with enzymes, the the, the urease, the, all these other great things. So, um, so fulvic acids, right? So fulvic acids generally in the marketplace. So, so humic acids again, to, just to stress. They're soil, they're a soil application, okay? 
Humic acids, humic acids are generally used with, with, with foliar fertilizers. That's it, I'll say generally, because that's generally what it doesn't mean it always happens. It's used to chelate trace elements, basically. That's, that's the number one form. So in, in cropping, cropping, um, well, my biggest market in SA is Air Peninsula with coppersine manganese, basically. Just chelated fertilizers, put it, a couple of litres in a tank mix and see you later, you know, and they're off. So, and the reason they're generally doing it is actually probably, you know, I can get, try and tell them all these great things, but it's actually just compatibility and, and, and you just use less, less handling, <laughs> you know, so it's simple as that. So about chelation, you get it into the plant easier, um, translocation, okay, so when, once it's in the plant, it actually the plant can use it a bit better. I talked about converting metallic ions, okay. Um, I talked oh, yeah, talk about compatibility and stress relief as well. So it's actually got, it's, it can almost be like, it seems like a pan, pan drop. Like, up when you, I don't know, when you, after you guys were on the flag there, you probably had a pan roll, it's sort of like having formic acid, a plant having formic acid. Is that a premature? Another that one? Probably got a few to choose from. Um, so yeah, it's a reduced rate, better compatibility. Um, there's actually quite a movement in, in cropping, and I, and I don't see there's any different to, to you guys putting something through your drip system, um, as in the inferior application, because um, um, this is a slide I was talking about. In furrow or in, in the soil, right, through your drip system, when you put a put a chelated product down, you, you're basically removing the charge. So yeah, this one you've got zinc with no charge, and this one you've got zinc with a charge. Okay, you put the zinc with no charge in there, the carbonates can't bind to it, so it stays available. Put it in here, <coughs> unchelated, carbonates can bind to it, so it protects it. It, pr it provides a protection mechanism for, for the plants to be able to get to it. And in high pH soils, that's actually really important because that's what's that's what's locking up your zinc in high pH soils or iron or whatever. On the leaf, it actually is a pretty similar concept. Negative charge on the leaf, right? You, you neutralise the charge and it just it, 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 it enables it, it to get into the leaf easier. There's also other things that work. Sorry, so I'm just saying, um, <coughs> so obviously trace elements can also kill the sulfates and the sulfates. Oxides, yep. amino acid, for sure. as well. Yep. Um, so using fulvic, does that uh, increase the efficacy of all of those? Um, they, so, so in that regard, there's, there's, there's a few different things. So, so amino, is, amino acids and, and, uh, and lignose sulfates um, work in a similar mechanism. They both have an anion, a negative charge, which does that, it okay. binds it up, right? Um, Oh, sorry, EDTAs as well. Yep, yep. It, it, it all, a lot of that comes down to the strength yep. of the keto. EDTAs don't have sulfates in it, right? So, so that it's um, it's a, it's a different mechanism, but it has a really strong bond. So, so they work differently in different um, soils, right? So, so I'm talking as a foliar. Well, and, uh, even as a foliar, um, there's a lot of there's a bit of there's a bit of EDTAs will put, give you the best uptake, best competitive, well, be, that's, that's seen as the, the duck's nuts, like that's the best stuff you can get. Even right? better than amino acids? Uh, so. Yeah, yeah, so this sort of, but the, some people, and I don't know the answer, I don't think anyone does, because it depends on who you work for, right? Some people say EDTA is the best, you get more into the plant, happy days, this is going to, you know, this is the best stuff you can get, it's compatible with everything. Um, but it's expensive, right? So then you get a company like me, says, well, hey, the amount of fulvic, uh, sorry, the amount of zinc you get into your leaf with our product per dollar spent is better, right? Um, do I know that for a fact? Well, we've done our trials and yeah, but you know, I'm sure the EPTA rep would probably have his trials as well, you know what I mean? So, um, so they're both good, right? Uh, I'll get to aminos in a second. Um, I guess the other thing is the fact that the form 
as an organic acid, which amino acids are, and forbics, right? So they're in a sort of organic acid category. Is the plant's more accepting and willing of, of what, it, what it wants to do, which has a lot of flaw, like there's some really, really deep stuff that I won't even get into that, you know, in terms of genetic expression and all this other type of stuff. But essentially the fulvics and the humics, uh, sorry, the fulvics and amino acids are, are sort of softer and, you know, so there's an argument with that. Lignosulfates, they operate in the same way as a, as a, um, as, as fulvics and aminos and phenolic acids, um, but they, they're, they're not, they're not a, they're not a natural like an amino or a, or a fulvic. Um, um, what else is there? So phenolics, phenolics are very good um, because they're, they're, the phenol groups are very good at, um, they're like a, uh, uh, so the leaves have a fatty tissue, a fatty waxy um, cuticle, right? So to get through that, so that's one thing, but the other part is getting through the waxy cuticle and you need, and, and phenol, phenolic acid is very good at breaking off, like you use phenols as, you know, to clean fat up off, you know, like, yeah, around barbies or whatever, you know, so phenols are good for that. So fulvics contain phenol groups, right? So, so they have a bit of, so the, the, how can you, a fulvic acid, as far as breaking a, um, and, and an amino acid, uh, have, um, they have that capacity to break the fatty, but they're, they're not as strong as a phenolic group. So you sort of, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul in some regards. With, um, amino acids versus fulvic acids, you know, there's some very good products in both categories and it also depends on the, 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 the actual um, um, like quality of the, of the fulvic or the amino acid, you know, so, so you can have a really good fulvic that's better than a really good amino acid, but you can have a really crappy fulvic that's better, that's not as good as a really good yeah. amino acid, you know what I mean? So you start, it's a really... So, so I guess that's where brand is, it's, you know, spend those first slides trying to just let you know, well, hey, we, we do this and we've, we've got some good stuff and other companies do good stuff as well. I guess our, our, our selling point over um, amino acids is that full have a stronger affinity, right? So you've got a, a greater um, amount of cation exchange so you can get more in, more chelated in solutions. So that's what we say. Um, I'll try and remain um, you know, level-headed with it, with it all. Um, so what about these performance of amino acids? You could do that as well. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you could, you could do, you could do a mix of both if, yeah. if you wanted. Um, but they they work in the same way. You know, like like oh, I've heard so many different stories about. Um, you know, uh, amino acids are better because of this. I've even been told that I've even heard a bloke over in Cummins say that fulvic acids are no good because they're an organic acid, but amino acids are, are, are the best because it ends up with, like, you know, this is an agronomist actually saying this to, like, so it's, yeah. At the end of the day, quality is everything in terms of, um, and, and price, you know, like it's got to be a good product at a good price, but, I mean, there, there are products of using fulvic acids that are, that are oh, I know, they're, they're, they're crap. You know, like you might as well be using just a sulfate and paying half the price for it. So, but there's also some really, really good um, amino acid products, and, and I class our our fulvic acid as a really good product. We do a lot of quality, um, um, you know, testing. Like we, our full, we send our fulvics to Monash University, where they test it for all different. Um, which I'll, I'll show you. So, so basically, oh, that's just some childhood. So this, this is what I'm getting at. So in terms of, this is just comparing fulvic acids with fulvic acids, right? The makeup of fulvic acids, there's, there's different components in fulvic acid that create chelation, right? So you asked about EDTA. EDTA groups um, is, EDTA stands for what's in, so it's a long body, some, some, whatever it's called, I don't, I don't know off the top of my head. But at the end of the day, there, there are EDTA groups in Fulvic acid, right? And 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 there, there's also all these other like, there's citric acid groups in fulvic. So so the amount of these different so those different components that make up fulvic acid chelate different nutrients in different ways. <laughs> you understand? So so 
if you have a fulvic acid that's full of one type, that's going to chelate one type of nutrient really, really well. If you have a, a you know, so, so it's all about numbers and diversity. So the affinity, the cation exchange component, about how those, how that's made up, they chelate differently. So basically it's all about that diversity and, and variety, right? The other thing is calcium, because calcium, if you have high calcium in your, in your product, right, it, it, when you put it, mix it with your sulfates, it binds with the salt with the with the um, sulfates and creates calcium sulfate, which is gypsum, which is a so it falls out of solution. So you can't get you can't mix that much in there. So you can only put a so if you've got a product that's only you know you've got a, and it's got copper in it and it's chelated by fulvic acid and it comes out blue. Well, you know, fulvic acid's dark. It's a, it's an organic acid. You know, like if it's got anything in it, it should be a nice dark colour. So it's, 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 it is important. It's an important thing because, as I said, it makes a difference between if you're paying three bucks a litre or dollar fifty, you want it to be chelated properly, don't you? So, um, so kelp, how am I going? Are we, so you, like, you, you know kelps, you know about them, seaweed ex extracts and that sort of thing? So, again, another one of these, these products that are, that are um, you know, um, there's many products on the market. You know, what are you guys, what's the best, you know, what's the best value for money? Very difficult for a consumer to, under, to, to know. Rip, oh, buddy, almost impossible. Because the problem with kelp is, oh, I thought this, this was the slide I was looking for. I'll finish what I was saying. The problem with kelp is there's many, many different types of kelp sources. It's like grass, like, you know, you've got your cooch grass and then you've got buddy, Sugar cane, they're still grasses, same as kelp. I mean, you have all different bloody types and from different, and different people come out and say, hey, we'll get ours from South Africa and we'll get ours from Tasmania and we'll get ours from, you know, and they tell you all these great things about how, how good they are. And they're, and they're right, like, the kelp's great stuff, if you ask me. Um, but at the end of the day, they, they, have, they, they have different Makeups, I guess, and they work differently in different environments. And the other thing is the extraction process. So I won't get into all this. There's a lot of good things. These are all science extracted from scientific research. Um, they made up of many different compounds, hormones, which I'll get into. That's that's the important thing about how, how crop, crops work. I'm just talking about the extraction methods. So, so basically, the key use for kelps is root flushing. That's, that's, that's how you should use it. Use them to trigger root flushes, um, which then your plant can go fight, finding more moisture, more, um, more nutrients, um, you know, more mineralization, you know, all, all of those great things. Calcium uptake. Um, so toxins are a rooting hormone, right? So that's, a, that's an important one. Um, cytokinins and gibberellin. So, I'm guessing a lot of you guys do crop, some of you guys are cropping as well as vineyards? No? No cropping guys? No? Okay, well, gibberellins, in, in terms of, um, I, don't, and I, I don't even know, I'm not an expert, in, I'm not a viticulturist, I'm not claiming to be, but gibberellins are all about internode um, cell division, right? The reason I was asking about the cropping guys is because a lot of them use gross retardants, okay, to, so they don't have the lodging of the of the you know the stem the, the, the wheat right and then, and, uh, and I guess I presume with you guys if elongation of the stem is a good thing well then it, this is, this sort of thing is a is a good thing we can't use them you can't use them uh, you can use them table grapes to extend the berries yeah okay you can't use your grapes but you can use kelp you can use kelp that contains your grapes exactly okay all right Get yeah, that, but anyway, so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's like, you, can't, you, can't, you, can't you can't apply, you can't apply GAs, um, in, in pure form. Okay, so, yeah, fair enough. Right. Right. Use the tablet so, right. No, it is what it is, but you can use kelp anyway, you can use kelp, but that's what it does, it extends your, yeah. your internal, like, and cytokinins all about cell division, so, so they're all hormonal benefits that when your plant wants to do this thing, it triggers so, so when you're talking about photosynthesis capturing carbon, it'll 
it's a hormonal stimulant that will trigger the plant to want to do these great things prior to flowering or whatever. So, um, so I guess how do we choose our kill? We, we um, because no one knows, there's actually no studies or anything done on, you know, ours has got more cytokines or ours has got more oxygen, so the ratio of this is better than that. And, yeah, you know, so we just simply took it to Monash, took a different, heap of different kelps to Monash University and said, can you guys do, do some pot trials and measure shoot and root growth? Um, we did it on Chinese snow peas, don't know why, so that's the crop that was used to choose our kelp. Um, and we came up with a kelp based on that result. Uh, we do an acid kelp and an alkaline kelp, right? The alkaline kelp is purely so you can mix with humic acids, right? To diversify that. The acid kelp is the one that got the best root and shoot growth. From that, we produced a product called Mega Kelp P, which I'm guessing some of you have used or know about, or, or yep. So the philosophy of Mega Kelp P is you've got kelp, triggers root flushes, all these great things which triggers more, like I talked about, mineralization, everything like that. However, if you're putting kelp on as a folly and you're triggering these things to happen, you know, you need a bit of you know, guts to kick along, I guess. So, so we, we came up with this, this mix that was a high phosphate and high trace element mix, basically. You need phosphates to capture carbon. You need, you need phosphates for energy. Phosphates are like the charge in the battery. So the, the analogy of, um, that I use for this one is that the, the kelp's like putting your foot on the accelerator and the phosphate's like having the petrol in the tank, basically. So with the phosphates and the kelp, and then the trace elements for sugar production. The other thing, the trace elements in this sort of thing is, is, is good for in um, uh, is stress conditions, triggering root flushes, um, um, copper, zinc, iron, and manganese are very important as an antioxidant in, in stressful environments. So that's all about energy. So, um, so that's how, what that one is. So we, we believe that, that this product is better than a straight kelp because it's got the full package. So it's used quite, quite extensively and it's growing quite a lot in viticulture. Like the, the growth in this product has been quite, quite large for us um, just because it seems to work in that. And the stages are, the main application stage is pre-flowering. It's still folder as well, yeah. As a folder, yeah. yeah. Just pre pre-flowering and nothing Nothing reinventing the wheel, just uh, flowering. That's a physiological, you know, stress, I guess, or a, it's it's like the big game of footy for the um, for the plant. And and doing this is about just producing. It's like having a bowl of pasta before. Food. So, if, if you're using this in place of, would you use this in place of um, putting out sort of pure zinc or pure manganese? Because obviously those yeah. industry practices using these sure, yeah. to flower to ensure particular boron too, which oh. you get. Good pollination of fruit set. Yeah. Um, would you use this? Would you be comfortable saying use this in case of using uh, um, a. Uh, uh, I'd, I'd still do what you, what you need to do. You can probably, you know, this has got, yeah, like, it's still, it's still got, is it, you know, this is, this is five litres. I don't know, manganese, because you think manganese is a big one, isn't it? Because that's five litres of right? Yeah. yeah. So if you put in five litres of that, <laughs> yeah. you're putting. I don't know, what's the yeah, 19, 100, about 100 grams of manganese out compared to a manganese chelate of it's 15% at 2 litres. Yeah. So you're getting, you probably, you can lower your rate yeah. of the others, but I'd still, I don't want to say don't do others. So, well, it just depends on, on your pH and your like boron. If you've got low boron, this boron, boron and this is not going to, you know, it's, it's, it's good, yeah. um, but it's, it's yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not an amelioration type product. It's more about um, at, at, at a given time to try and help um, give energy to, to the plant. So I mean, I, I would, all, I'm, again, I'm not a bit of culturalist, but in you know, I sort of do a little bit of a lot of different crops. But I always just fall back onto the get your soil right, know what you're removing, you know, know your physiological stages, SAP test, PDL test, whatever. Use your lab services and make logical decisions based on what what you know. And I guess this one's just more about pre-flowering. Seems to give energy to, to facilitate that you know stress time. I guess so. That's the philosophy of it. Um, 
But the other one is root flushing. So later, even later on in the crop, trying to get calcium into the plant. So so many people want to manage calcium with foliars or whatever. And this is this is not an omni thing. I've, I've actually in my studies, like it's, it's interesting as sort of professor of soil chemist chemistry. He's, he was like, big on you know. I knew that I knew the um, the things to sort of put into your assignments and that that he likes because he was big big strong one on. Um, like we actually sell foliar calcium products and all this sort of thing. But I'm a believer of, of um, if you want to get calcium into the plant, and, and especially in the high pH soil, triggering root flushes, that's the key. Getting because calcium gets taken in through the root tip. So if you if you if your roots are stagnant, right, and you know you sort of, but if you give it a little little sort of jab in the arm and bloody get going, then the roots start going, but then they'll find more calcium and and you're away again. So, um, and I, don't, I think that'll do. I'm sort of, I'm sort of talking, and I hope you've taken some of it in. Um, as I said, it's it's um, it's just part of a good a good program. I mean, in the, in the world that we the world we live in, um, you know, you guys are trying to get the maximum efficiencies in in, in what you're doing, um, but we also want want um, sustainability as well. So the way one of the good ways of thinking of, of, of a humic acid in, in the soil is you're doing something something good. You know, you put putting a lot of these chemicals, a lot of a lot of soluble fertilizers as well. Uh, yeah, this is a giving back a little bit as well, I think. So um, quality is everything. Um, talk about that and you know that's me it's, it's an hour. Yeah, that's really good. Well, thank you, Ryan. That was um, yeah, really good. Um, yeah, it's, it is good to break down that um, you know, just that whole uh, idea of what full vitamin humic are, and, and you know, we talk about in, in store, we talk about you know, you put out your humic through your fertigation, and well, why do we do that? And what are the benefits of it? So hopefully, this has cleared up a few things. Any other queries will always hit us up. Ryan's going to be here during the smoker break. And, yep. Um, I'll leave my cards here. Yeah, yeah, and, and yeah, you can always always email, call, whatever. And, and just to find out um, a bit more about it. But yeah, I mean, this, this stuff, it is real. It's not just us there flogging to here just for the sake of flogging off. And it's all there for a, um, for a particular reason. So, yeah, so thanks for listening. And a little quiz. I was going to do a draw. I'm going to do a little quiz. Right? What am I going to ask? One question. Can we get to come in the food? Are on this? No trouble. Hey? You look, you look like you're. Um, no, I'm ineligible. <laughs> right, on. so what can I say? What what was the key part of so that? If, if everybody's comfortable with the temperature, I was asked whether we were getting too hot. And you want some air con? Or are you happy? Everybody happy? Good. All right, thanks, Ross. So I'm not going to look there, I'll probably look here. But it's just, uh, and, uh, just want to say thanks boys for the opportunity. I know it's a, they're looking up a little bit, but hopefully you'll be all right. Mm. A lot of this stuff will look pretty familiar, and uh, so uh, it won't be such a strain. I'm going to, uh, just got to acknowledge Scott Payton, our horticulture R&D guy from Western Australia. He's a gun, particularly in viticulture. It gets the, the beauty of being able to um, uh, work in viticulture trials um, on a daily basis. And uh, we've got a couple of new products to release in the next couple of years. One is a biological that has uh, control efficacy on both powdery mildew and botrytis as well as alternaria in apples and uh, in, in vines and also alternaria and those other two in apples so he's a busy boy getting MRLs and stuff together that'll be an exciting product to see and hopefully we'll have that in Langon Creek next year. Um, I wanted to uh, uh, so I'm here representing New Farm and I've been a territory manager for years. There's a new territory manager responsible for Langon Creek and it's Julian Pierce. some of you might remember him from FPA days years and years ago. He was an agronomist out there, but mostly in Broadacre. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not uh, uh, in this as a territory manager here. I'm representing. I'm the horticulture manager for South Australia now, with a territory in the Riverland and whatever. So uh, I get to focus a little bit more on horticulture, which is pretty cool, and uh, a little bit, uh, quite a bit less on Broadacre. So one of the things I probably that I remember over oh, since we released Microthyl. 24, 25 years ago, is that we've always been really heavily invested in viticulture, in horticulture, but particularly viticulture. Um, 
But that hasn't always been that apparent, but I can tell you in the last four or five years, since we walked away from BASF and Cabrio and Falan and all those products, it's amazing what's happened, what's changed. And so you'll see a lot more in this space. And what I mean by working in viticulture, I'd have to say we've always been very practically orientated in terms of how we uh, we do a lot of trial work. We do more trial work than any chemical company in Australia. I think it's about 20 million, 22 million. I think the nearest is about five or six million. So we spend a fortune in, uh, in R&D, but particularly the main questions are, what impact will this have on the grower? Uh, how will it change his options? Uh, how much will it be? Where will it fit relative to other companies' products? So a lot of that thinking, particularly Scott's thinking, will be present today, which is why I want to acknowledge him. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about Digger, very briefly, a little bit about Amicus Blue, which is a new mode of action for downy mildew. Uh, it was a product that uh, was originally designed for grapes, and uh, uh, the marketing team got hold of it and had a big chat with Mules, and, and they were big in brassicas uh, in, uh, um, in Werribee, and it got priced and positioned in broccoli, and it was far too expensive in viticulture and uh, funnily enough they've had a relook at all that and uh, um, and so now um, it's been relaunched this year in viticulture it's a lot more appealing as a downy mildew product and then we'll have a really general discussion about Botecta biologicals I think uh, I've heard enough presentations from enough people enough suppliers to know that uh, there's only one way to go and that's have a good general discussion so everyone understands where all the products fit and uh, so that'll be a little bit more interactive and some of the notes that Scott sent me I'll use for that. So I um, <coughs> want to talk a little bit about powdered mildew first, then go on to downy and then finish off with uh, botrytis and those, uh, and those biologicals. So I don't want to spend too much time on this slide, but I really just want to remind you all of how important, of course, it is to, uh, uh, with powdery mildew, that that expression rate's definitely a function of inoculum load and temperature. And most of you would have seen this graph before which demonstrates the principle that we work on on a daily basis, of course, in the vineyard, and that is you get hold of, uh, the key to getting hold of powdery mildew is working through that lag phase. If you do it properly and effectively during the lag phase, you're gonna have nowhere near the severity and certainly not the incidence as time goes on. Uh, the more robust the programs are when you can't see the disease, uh, will determine how much you'll see later in the season. Of course, you're well and truly aware of that. And uh, so, with that in mind, I just wanted to talk a little bit about Digger and uh, just a little bit about how Digger came about. Years ago, we had a product called Cabrio, and we were talking about it this morning. And uh, Cabrio, towards the end of its life with us, was starting to fail. And it had already started to fail in New York State. That was the first place where it, uh, it started to fall down. And in some cases, those particular vineyards applied Cabrio on six occasions in one season. So, Back then, we had no idea. And there was a guy called Wayne Wilcox that came out to Australia, and, uh, and Professor Wayne Wilcox, and he uh, came and he sat down with our R&D team, and we told him what the problem was. And he said, it's easy, just use diphenylconazole. That's what we do, uh, to overcome this powdery mildew issue that was being created by Cabrio. And of course, uh, back then, diphenylconazole was scored in potatoes. It had only ever been used in potatoes. So, uh, over a period of the next five or six years, New Farms R&D team, particularly in viticulture, uh, took diphenylconazole and turned into Digger and what we see today. So, uh, and, and of course it hasn't been replicated. So it's a group three fungicide, as we all know. It's a really robust curative, um, has standout uh, length of protection, uh, as well as being really, really robust. And I think uh, it's unlike, I don't, I don't want you to use it like we use Rubigan or Myclos, it's not for late, it's for early, to build foundations that you then use that other really good chemistry like uh, the flutes and the vivandos and the cassavis and the baravas. It builds a foundation underneath them so that they can do their work but this thing keeps going. And if you need to go late, then Myclos is your option. But this is a product that we have early and there's been some changes this year, it's now registered out to 29. So you can get, you know, uh, you can use it during that fruiting period really effectively. And this is the slide that I like the best. It's the coolest one. Uh, it looks at the first block of columns. This is all Scott's work. So it's a summary of eight trials uh, conducted in Western Australia, and they're all assessed at 28 days 
after treatment. And the first is the untreated control. And you can see of these eight trials, a huge variation in terms of um, uh, powder and mildew incidence, which is not unexpected. And if I can take you to the third set of data, that's topaz at, across those eight sites. And that probably wouldn't surprise you either. There's a huge variation in its performance. And, uh, and to some degree, that's why probably DMIs have lost a bit of favour, haven't they? Yeah, we just think, well, uh, Topaz it performs like that, and I think all of us, particularly um, you, AJ, that have seen a lot of this out in the field, and also uh, everyone else, you would see not that would not be unusual to see. And the fourth column along uh, on the right is Domar, which is another really good DMI, and you can see its performance is certainly better than Topaz. But the second group of, of data, the second lot of summaries of those eight trials, is Digger at 25 mils per 100 litres. So. What Wayne Wilcox told us way back then about diphenyconazole is absolutely right here in Australia as well. Its performance across a range of uh, populations of powdery mildew are significant. Probably the only point I want to make other than that uh, is that unlike some other DMIs, this, this DMI isn't as good on active infections. So it's not as good as a curative as it is as a protectant. It's a really, really good product when put on before the disease expression is seen. Is that why they put the bottom period of EL29? So the reason why it's gone to EL29, yeah, so it's EL29, that was effective as of August, so it's easy to miss. Yeah. It's just recent, and so Scott was quite happy at 31. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, um, but the likes of Accolade and a number of others were, start, you know, were worried about pinging with other actives, as you yeah. can imagine. So, for safety's sake, um, uh, we brought it back to 29. Yeah, but he so would it's, it's not from putting it under pressure later in the season, which is what happened with Robin. Uh, it's under pressure later in the season with disease present and this has, this has, we've seen activity out to 60 days with this product and uh, not something you would recommend but it's extremely good in terms of its length of, uh, length of activity. And that's what I meant about it underscoring. And the, first, the reason for putting that in there uh, was to, is really to make the point that it is definitely a DMI to be used early. Each of them are very, very different in, the, in terms of their capability and I love that slide because it shows a variation across a whole range of sites. Uh, and you know, God bless Scott, he just travels all around Western Australia like a mad woman and putting these trials out and that's the sum total of the sort of research he does. But that's Digger, builds a really good solid foundation for then using products like, you know, Vivando, Flute, Moravis. Um, so right now we're in, you know, we're in a position where probably Moravis is going to go on soon and then a Digger leading, as next leading up towards Christmas would be sweet and uh, in terms of length of activity. And in fact, couldn't think of a better combination right now, to be honest, without asking you, AJ. Um, something that you're familiar with, uh, microthylus burst or, or a sulfur of any description. The only reason I wanted to put this on, and everyone knows about sulfur, so that's not the purpose of this slide, but two things. One, I wanted to demonstrate that uh, we've, we do a lot of benchmarking work comparing the performance of different powdery mildew fungicides in the same vineyard at the same time on a regular basis. Why do we do that? Because it helps us to build solid fungicide programs to understand where they're good, where they're bad, not just ours, other competitive products as well. And I wanted to put this slide up just to show, and I've got four or five shots, uh, slides around this, but I wanted to show this um, <coughs> really I'll just focus on the uh, graph on the right hand side. Um, those top three bars are 400 grams per 100 litres of uh, microthyl in this particular case. And that's another point that I will make. I know every time we discuss sulfur, it's almost always on price. But can I tell you, there's really only a couple that are any good. And there really is. And, uh, and you would be well worth buying those. And microthyl, UPLs, pretty much the same. When we grew and developed microthyl, it was owned by a company called Cerex Agri, and they were anal about that product. And UPL picked it up and, and now run with it, and the other one would be Thyvege. Really, they're two you know, uh, class acts in terms of sulfur, as far as I'm concerned. So the top three bars are 400 grams per 100 litres of microthyl, and I've done, we've done uh, 
uh, 3x timing plus duet at the top and then 3x timing and then 1x timing and the purpose of that was really we do concentrate spraying of course to really demonstrate two things one sulfur quality but secondly spray application quality how good that is so what uh, the next three bars below the four, those three at the top are the same uh, treatments but with 200 grams per 100 litres and uh, I know you know early on the season we like to go 600 for mites and whatever else but this really demonstrates I think two things one there's very little variation in those 400 gram treatments at the top with either of that three times one times or with the addition of duet but look where they're all are with the 200 they're all over the place and uh, um, I think there's a really good message in that this is the uh, a summary of the trial work uh, that we did with Pros Prosper when we were benchmarking and again a couple of these things and I'm once again please don't read into this slide that Digger is significantly better than all of these. The reason why I had this, uh, this treat these treatments are done at 35 days after application. So the performance of all of those products to the right of Digger, which is the second treatment there, to the right of Digger have all done their work and now they're starting to drop away whereas Digit is still continuing on. So, um, uh, Prosper is a good product. There's some watch outs now around re-entry, of course. And there has been some issues around growers drifting too close to flowering, you know, with this sort of product in recent years. It is in no way saying Prosper is not a good product in this situation. Uh, in fact, all of those, with the exception of Cabrio, and we all know have, you know, terrific performance on power and <coughs> energy. But at 35 days after treatment, a product like Digger is protecting is protecting those products that are starting to fail. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's all I want to give. Uh, the only message I want to give you, I don't want, because I think the other point that's really worth mentioning is that <coughs> we're not saying just use Digger all the time. It's a DIY. It's an important rotational tool, and in fact, you know, given that data, you can turn products that are previously starting to drift. They can become more. Uh, effective with time. So rotate would be the key. And there's another new DMI on the market as well, which I'm sure that you're aware of and you'll start using. But uh, rotate the DMIs and Digger is a really good option around about now. <coughs> yeah? Happy with that? Good. Flute. Uh, Scotty did this work once again, um, of course. And once again, you know, I love this slide. Uh, and the reason why is that once again, he's out to um, this is incidence at 33 days, which is in the green, to the dark green, almost black, at 46 days after application, and then um, incidence on bunches is in the orange. So, <clears throat> Flute is an extremely good product, obviously, mostly post-flowering, has really good, strong um, vapour activity. Um, once again, a product like Digger, out to 46 days, is still providing really good solid foundation for protection. Flute has done its work by now. And he makes the point that with the expanded use rate, 25 to 35, the, the longevity of Flute might drop away. This is at the higher rate. But the performance of that product might drop away. So um, very, very good post flowering. Um, obviously limited to two sprays and whatever else. But once again, just demonstrates Topaz is breaking down. Digger is as solid as. Filan, of course, as we know, is really, you know, has been quite solid from powdery mildew and flute at that high rate, definitely starting to, to show signs of breaking down, but all its work was done um, a week or two prior to that. So just touching back on the, um, <coughs> I just noticed that the watch out there, so, so Digger's now, I haven't seen that, it's now, it's got a usage range now, is that right? Digger? Yeah. Yes, definitely. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, so it, uh, uh, and it goes out to 29, which pretty much covers the, the you know, the fruiting period, so yeah. fruit development period, so we're really happy with that. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so it, it can be used really early, it's early as 14, yeah. so it can go on now. But I think a lot of people are thinking maybe Moravis in that situation. Yeah. And and if you're using Moravis and Digger during that lag phase, you're seriously in a lot better position coming into Christmas. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm thinking with Digger. Yeah, you're exactly. Going into, you know, L29 and then putting on 36 going into, um, yeah. Right, just to ensure they come back to a nice 
So I know we're talking about powdery, but it's real. It's, sometimes it's really good to see what the performance of each of these products are um, and how they um, and how they go relative to each other and how they fit into the program. So, uh, and if we're looking, if I put on if I put on a Ravis and a Digger, for example, at this stage during this lag phase, I, you know, and I'm watching my cost and whatever. I might think twice about a couple of other options later. In terms of pound for pound, Scott will quote this. Uh, he, it is, and he said this at Langham Creek a couple of weeks ago. It's Moravis like control uh, at a very cost effective, at a very cost effective price. So, um, we'll keep in mind. The van, though, once again, uh, a story. Uh, watch it out, are of course best applied in front of infection. Both really, really good actives. Extremely good, particularly if you've had digger on you know up to 30 or 40 days prior uh, it's going to provide you know once again that foundation for the van and kasabi which are both really good actives and this trial data once again shows you can see cabrio is really starting to fail uh, in that particular vineyard as a result of you know drift and resistance topaz also don't mark to some degree but digger um, uh, and this is done at Car caradar which is south of margaret river in that sea foggy <coughs> misty mess that you get down there um, so ideal windows, you know, obviously uh, Kasabi out to 31, and uh, but still relative to it really just puts into uh, perspective the importance of um, uh, a digger early and digger to under underpin those key products. Are there any questions before I move on to Downey? No? Okay. So in Downey, I want to just talk briefly about this new active Amicus Blue and then touch just I really like, if you've got any questions about copper, I wouldn't mind hearing them. Because I'm hearing some stories around about copper which, I'm not, which, are, um, which are raising a few alarm bells. So it's another product like sulfur that we tend to abuse a little bit. So there's lots of words here, so uh, just maybe just listen to the, uh, to the story and I'll explain it. This is a product, I'll just take it to the bottom first. Um, there is a reduced retail price on this product from $65 a litre last year, which was hellishly expensive. Um, in a viticultural sense, but quite competitive in a uh, brassica sense. Uh, and they, we've predicted an increase in volume of a certain, you know, certain litreage, and that flow through the factories has allowed, allowed us to drop the price to make it more respectful. So that, commercially, this product is going to have a lot better fit in viticulture than it has in the past. I went there initially so that it helps to frame for you where this product fits. It's a totally new mode of action. It's been on the market for a few years, as I mentioned, mainly in brassicas. But the one thing I remember that research is telling us is it does two diseases really well, and both of them are other mycetes that require moisture to be effective. And one of them is white blister in brassica, and the other one is downy mildew and vines. It's highly effective on downy mildew and vines. Um, very robust success. Part of that reason is it has efficacy on like multiple stages of the life cycle, not just one or two. So it's not just sporangia inhibiting. Uh, it has a ef efficacy on a range. So if you're a grower, you might be looking to say give uh, group 40s a rest, like um, Rebus and Downright or Acrobat. That might be a really good, you know, rotational tool. Um, pre and post flowering in varieties that are a bit sensitive to copper, for example, or perhaps where we, we may get some November, December rain in sensitive areas, sensitive varieties, sensitive parts of the vineyard, you know, those sorts of situations. This is a new uh, active for Downey, and uh, it's a co-formulation of an active called Amisolbrom, and also has tri-basic copper sulfate. So a portion of it is tri-base blue, and uh, which is sort of a responsible way to manage that Amisolbrom active ingredient. So uh, that's probably as good a summary as I can give. Um, don't get too caught up by this except for, to explain that it has efficacy on all four points of the life cycle and, and the unique bit is it has a uh, efficacy on this zoospore motility on the leaf. The, uh, the ability of these zoospores with uh, downy mildew to be able to float across the leaf surface that has moisture on it it controls them, which not, uh, no other active does. And the way it does that um, is probably best described with this slide. So um, <coughs> the leaves on the, um, on the right hand side so that show that uh, amisolbrum is applied to the leaf and it, it gets into the plant really, really quickly, but it just sits just below the cuticle layer. And then when the leaf um, 
becomes moist again as a result of heavy dew, rainfall, irrigation, whatever, the, uh, the active desorbs and comes back onto the leaf surface, controlling those zoospores that move, and then it goes back down to the leaf. Back up again when it's wet, it comes back down. So, and that's evidenced by um, the graphs on the, on the left hand side that show the light green is basically the active ingredient retrieved from the cuticular wax. So it doesn't go into the leaf. Um, it doesn't stay on the leaf surface, it doesn't go into the leaf actor still. The majority of it in that light green stays just under the surface and it comes back up. So it's really quite weird and unique. So I thought the best slide to show you was one that we did um, in Lenswood in two, oh, low, in 2014. This would be interesting. Uh, have you got the cord? I don't want the power. Oh, it's right there. There you go. Um, in 2014, and uh, so we done in 2011. That would have been That was a really bad. And it's more a process thing. So in this trip, in this trial, because uh, I'm really not interested in one-off uses, I'm much more interested in the, um, in the process stuff. It makes a lot more sense. And we're doing that. We're doing that again here in uh, South Australia this year. So that'll be a good video. Let's go and have a look at that. Uh, where does this go? Oh, yeah. Right. And uh, so these. These treatments had um, two dragon diathonon, two diathonons pre-flowering. Has anyone used dragon this year, by the way? Uh, there's an active that's going to get some work. I need to do a lot more work with that. Two dragons pre-flowering, uh, and then it either had uh, two rebuses or two amicus blues or two downrights during flowering, and then it had two tribase blues post-flowering. And these are the results. And this is the untreated control, of course, which had nothing. <coughs> so reasonable incidence, um, almost 100% incidence, and you know, reasonable severity, so 30%. So from this, you can see uh, all pretty consistent. All great opportunities, rotational tools. Downright or acrobats hardly used at all anymore, but the columns, you know, uh, sets of data two and three show uh, Reef Cinemicus Blue to be pretty much uh, exactly the same in terms of down and mildew performance, yeah? So I just want to talk a little bit about copper because um, this traditionally has been a really good tri based blue area and, and still is. Um, but sometimes it wavers a little bit and it's important to, uh, to just to, remark, you know, to really make the point that, you know, it's really important to pick the copper formulation that matches the disease risk for your place. Sometimes it's not always whatever's the cheapest and there's plenty of cheap stuff around. And certainly the work that we did with Tribase Blue with the low use rate at 125 mils has made that product just so cost effective and so good in terms of performance. I, uh, I couldn't be happier in that regard. But just have a look at this trial, for instance, because they're not all the same, even though they come out of pretty much the same stuff. So it's seven days after treatment, these, uh, the green is the untreated control, and then you've got tri-base blue at 2.5 litres, which is uh, um, the old uh, low use rate. Tri-base blue at 4.2, then coside at 2.5 kilos, and nor shield at 2.5 kilos, which is an oxide. So at seven days after treatment, you can see they all prick pretty well. Yeah? At 14 days after treatment, you can see that the hydroxide and the oxychlorides, the last two treatments are starting to fail. But the triose blue at both rates um, are starting to work pretty well, even though the, low, the lower rate not as well as the high rate. But once you get to 21 days after treatment, the triose blue treatments the, uh, in the dark green and the yellow are performing still equal to or better than the hydroxides or the oxides at 14 days. Can we see that? Whereas the others need reapplying well and truly. They need reapplying after 14 or 10 days. So I love variation in agriculture because it tells us a story. And the story there is that um, tri-base blue in the formulation it is, is a superior copper to those others. And now with the lower use rates, you find the performance will not be that much different uh, than them. And uh, there's been a few around at the moment that are, you know, claiming they have 
is a rely on product that claims it has some short term activity and it has some long term activity. Part of it, one of the components of it is an oxychloride. So oxychlorides are not long term, they are sometimes and not all. So if you've got half that's a hydroxide and half that's an oxychloride, the oxychloride is the short term. It'll burn, it's gone and it's out doing uh, doing its business, which is not that similar to cosine, but once it's gone, it's gone and you need to reapply. The oxychloride bit, half of it will never be fungicide. So really, those in-bag mixes of two uh, copper formulations will just mean less, hydro less hydroxide ions for, for the fungicidal activity. The only way to get um, good longevity is to buy a tri-basic liquid like tri-base glue, for example. So just to prove that, these were this was trials that we took some viticulturists to, and, and AJ, if you've been around, you would have come. Uh, but we will. Uh, there's a trial being done similar to this next year. This was done in Downey uh, Mildew in the Yarra Valley. This was the untreated control. So this is what it looks like in the field. This is untreated control. This is co-side opti at uh, 80 grams per 100 litres. So that's 24 grams of active of copper per 100 litres. Untreated control, co-side opti at 80 grams. That's tri-base blue at the same grams active. So that's 125 mils of uh, 100 litres of tri-base blue. That's co-side opti. And this is CHAMP DP at 125 grams, which is our dry pill product, which is 47 grams of active, so double. And that's tri-base blue at 250 mils per 100 litres, which is also the same grams active. So they perform differently in the vineyard as well. Yeah? Mind you, some of that is downy, some of it is rust. You can see up the top right there, where it's literally been dripping off the leaf down, and it was a really bad downy year in this particular example. They do perform differently. So, any questions on down? Okay. Um, this is a funny disease. We had no, we had no, I had no trouble getting uh, anyone to a Botrytis meeting in 2000, at the end of 2016. But do you reckon you can get anyone to a meeting about Botrytis since? No, I, I hope <laughs> now. <laughs> it, uh, and about two years ago we released a product called Botecta. And uh, it, two of the worst Botrytis years I think on, uh, uh, on record. Nevertheless, that's fine. So we all know the basics about latent, latent infection versus um, you know, wound site injury. And uh, it's, it, you're right, it's not a funny disease if you've got it. And uh, we, uh, we all understand how it fits. And I'd like to have a discussion, if I could, inspired by Scott, um, about, and there's a lot of Scott in this presentation. And uh, I'm gonna use some of his notes because I don't want to miss anything. Um, but those, there are real, two really, really clear issues, um, late infection and wound side injury that we have in our vineyards that we need to deal with. Best summarised by saying, obviously, free moisture and temperature. Uh, we've had temperature, we haven't had free moisture, would be critical to the expression and infection of what he calls the beautiful disease. Once it gets going, it's not beautiful, I know, but it's just amazing how it grows. So, let's just have a look at this. Um, when you have a discussion about the trials in terms of control, we're losing shit at a rapid rate of knots. There's no doubt about it. And let's look at leaf infection. We've still got a product like uh, Barrack or Bravo, which is an M5 multi-site, but for how long, AJ? Yeah. Barrack or Bravo, chlorothalonil? Yeah. No, for that long. You'd be, I think 12 months, we'd be lucky if we had it for 12 months, job. And um, it's, uh, it's not a product we're gonna, we're gonna have around for a long time yet. Pound for pound, about as good as you'll get. Um, in terms of um, uh, disease control for the cost, but that's going. Um, so er, what have we got early flowering to, uh, to the completion of flowering? Well, we've got you know, G17s like Teldor, uh, a G9, which is like Scala, or a combination of G9 and 12 like Switch, and then we've got Vertectus, Serenade Opti, Seraphil, and so forth. Uh, post flowering, we've still got, we've got Solaris, of course, which has its some really neat positions, as does um, Switch and Prolectus, and there's a move towards putting those two as early as possible. And then, after that, we've just got biologicals. And, uh, and I wanted to have a discussion, if I could, about those in a minute. And I want to just show you this, and 
New Farm as a whole wouldn't like me showing you this, but I'm going to show you anyway. Uh, it it's, comes from Scott and it's data that's been produced by Curtin University. I don't want you to worry too much about the words, but uh, if you look across those columns, Cipridina, which is a component, a group nine component of Switch and Solaris, and um, Penhexenmet, which is a uh, part of Teldor and Prolectus, and then Flutioxinol is a part of Switch, and then lastly is the group nine Boscolid. And what these guys do at Curtin University now is they have this ability to do on-site testing of uh, rackets and uh, leaf cat, uh, cat scars, capsins, etc., etc., and they can take them and DNA test them for resistance to certain actives. So this is a sample of some work they've done in the south, the south of uh, Western Australia, mostly Margaret River, but also at Caradale. Uh, and there are 30 samples here, and the ones highlighted in red uh, have a high level of resistance to those actives. So if you look at Cipridina, which is the group nine component of Solaris and Switch, that's a little bit alarming. And if you look right across to Boscolid on the far right, almost, um, you can see uh, that that's probably not surprising, uh, that we're seeing resistance in those, um, in those developing to that particular active. Um, Fenhexenamid, which is the second column along, we're starting to see some, uh, uh, some red bars appearing there. So I might paint a bit of a picture that uh, this is coming. And, you know, Western Australia have had a lot worse in terms of disease infection over the last couple of years. You know, they had cyclones last year, didn't they, that came down that coast, that coastal area. Plus, if you go down south of Margaret River in Caradale, they get a lot of sea fog, a lot of moisture, a lot of heavy dews and so on. That can be a real problem. And on the far right column, that's flutioxinol, uh, which is sung as the middle column but they have a new method of incubating the disease to be able to identify its level of uh, resistance or tolerance, if you like. And as you can see, there are far more coloured far more coloured um, boxes there that indicate that there is some problems with uh, flutioxin, which is a really, which is the group two, 12 component of switch. So things are starting to fall off a little bit in that area. So we need, I think, with those sorts of actives, they are so important to us. The thing that we need to do with the trials, as I've mentioned in the bottom left-hand corner, is we've got to focus on reducing that population load to take the pressure off those actives when, when the chips are down. And that's pretty much the case with every disease we do with powdery particularly. But in this situation, I mean, you only have to look between 19 and 31 uh, for powdery mildew control on the uh, on the AP, uh, sorry, on the AWR website, and there is a hundred just about actives you can use. We don't have that with the trials. So, I wanted to have a, just a general discussion about biological fungicides and how do we get to a point where we can understand them a little bit more. And uh, Jock, I'd like you to hop in any time you like because you've been part of this presentation before and you've heard it before, but so far, as I mentioned before, we've released these products a couple of years ago, and it's not so much, and we're, up until then we focused a lot on how, uh, how you would use these particular products based on what we've learned, but the truth is, we want to know why, and why is far more important, why would growers adopt these uh, biological fungicides, and in general, there are pretty much two groups. First group is that, that group of growers that look at it and go, well look, I'm running out of you know, synthetic chemistry options, I, uh, uh, I better consider doing something. Um, and there are others, and it's growing, particularly in McLaren Vale, uh, that are adopting an organic philosophy um, or organic principles. And then, you know, I was staggered to hear that almost 30% of that McLaren Vale area would be adopting some form of organic principles. So if, depending on which camp you're in, without really understanding the mode of action of these products and how they work, at the end of the day, we will just focus on price, and that's not what this is about. Price is important, but the mode of action will help us determine exactly what, um, where the best place is, and they're not all the same. So I just want to touch that on that a little bit. Um, and the reason I want to touch on it is because we've been dealing with synthetic chemistry for so long. So if you're a grower on the left-hand side, you know that you've got a range of synthetic chemistry options. And an example would be different. 
let's say we picked it. There's a, a group three, really robust, um, curative um, fungicide with some, uh, sorry, a protecting fungicide with sort of very little curative action. We know that it doesn't work particularly well with coppers and you know, we understand it's got a really, um, it's got a 29 uh, cutoff point and you know, a little bit more for uh, domestic growth. Those parameters help us to determine exactly where we put it uh, and its efficacy in powder and algae. And with synthetic chemistry, there is a lot more margin for error. There are a lot of things can go wrong and the result will still be pretty much the same. Whereas with biologicals, there's a lot more that can go wrong. So there's a lot more that need to be understood. So it's more about what's happening in the vineyard for you. It becomes much more how do we, I'm going to read some of these notes because I don't want to miss anything. It, um, those sorts of characteristics, the sort of things that he would list as, you know, spray coverage, physical crop extension, you know, uh, nozzle pressure, water quality, canopy estimations, uh, structures, whether it's VSP or not, of course light exposure, whether it's been leaf plucked or not, insect pressure, all those things will uh, conspire to make these biologicals work better or not as well. So I wanted to have this general discussion, if we possibly could, about, because I've, I've sat through a few supplier presentations lately and they irritate me when they say things like, this particular product doesn't need to be stored in the fridge, so it's better or this product is $130 and not something or other, therefore it must be better. I'd like us to just think a little bit about where each of these uh, uh, things and just to um, um, maybe have, I wouldn't mind having a little bit more of a, uh, a chat. So a product like Cerafil uh, is a bacillus solution and uh, it is exactly the same um, it's listed on the label exactly the same as Serenade Opti. Both of them are exactly the same in, uh, as they appear on the label, but they are different strains of bacillus or bacteria, different strains, and they display you know, slightly different qualities. So what I didn't realise um, is that Cerafil contains a really high concentration of what they call these colony forming units. Um, and these are, uh, of this bacterium that has really no antifungal compound uh, present at all. So what happens is the grower sprays on the bacterium and then it colonises on the plant and it releases these things called lipopeptides. So it's the lipopeptides that are the microbial uh, compounds. They're the ones that break down the membranes uh, of the particular pathogen. Not so much the bacterium, if that makes sense. So, the cell feature for a product like that is that uh, it's applied to the leaf, it populates and it occupies space on the leaf, it takes up nutrients and so on that are present on the leaf that would be normally consumed by the pathogen and it produces these lipopeptides which then have activity on the pathogen. So there's a three-way mode of action which sounds pretty cool uh, but often the devil's in the detail and I'll explain why. So as you know, and, and pardon me for reading, but um, so the grower, what you want in that situation is maximum surface protection so that everywhere on the leaf it's producing, uh, it's occupying space, it's eating the nutrients that would be normally eaten by the pathogen and it's also producing these lipopeptides that will then go and uh, break down the membranes and control the, the pathogen. Uh, sometimes the bacterium doesn't colonise at the same rate on every soil, on every leaf surface, uh, or for a period of time. And for example, Cerafil needs to be in the presence of free water on the leaf. And uh, it's, it colonises best when the plant surface maintains 90% of that moisture for that for a, a period of time, which is not always going to be practical in our environment. That's not always going to happen. So, without that protective shield, um, the whole system, that that particular product can fall apart. So, um, and this is not being, and believe me, this is not being uh, critical of this product, it's just the characteristics of that product. Uh, it very much depends on colonisation rate and its ability to be able to convert to lipopeptides to then go and kill the fungus. That's the, uh, or the pathogen. So that's why a product like Cerafil uh, is labelled for use in vines from three to 14 days. From three days to 14 days, sprayed because 
this is a product that you need to layer on the leaf so that you're getting constantly getting activity and lipopeptides being produced, colonizing, spreading, eating all the, uh, it has to, so that's quite a uh, restrictive spray interval if you have to go three. Part of the, um, and it also states on the label, in low disease pressure situations. Serenodopti, on the other hand, uh, which is a product that Bayer has, states on the label that it contains uh, a lower number of these colony forming units, or the bacteria that form colonies and whatever, um, of the same bacillus species. Um, and their competitors make a big deal about that. Well, we have more colonizing forming units than what this product has. But the truth is that um, any UV exposure with their active will kill the organism. So it doesn't really matter how much they have. The beauty of a product like Serenade Optum uh, is that when, what you purchase when you purchase that product is the actual lipopeptide compound that have already been cultured somewhere else. And they harvest that, they put it into a product. So you're not applying the bacteria that then needs to colonize, that then needs to produce the lipopeptide. Does that make sense? You are, with Serenade Opti, for example, buying the lipopeptide, which makes a little bit more sense. But still, those hippopeptides will last five to seven days on the leaf. So you have to keep reapplying. In order to maintain that protection for botrytis, uh, you need to keep, I should be looking at you to see if this is right. You need to keep applying them. So they might be a third of the price or half the price or whatever, but they need to be constantly applied depending on what's happening in the vineyard. And um, has anyone used trichoderma? So, Brilliant, absolutely brilliant, except that corpus don't like it. But that physically eats mycelium, as you know, and uh, it's, it's such a shame that the work hasn't been finished with that product because um, it is uh, magnificent in a term where, where disease is present in just actually getting in and mongering the mycelium and just absolutely knocking down a population that exists. Um, so, but it really it needs a food source in order to do it. And, uh, um, so very good, once again, on superficial infection, but not so good, obviously, on latent infection. So it fits in beautifully around Verizon, and, uh, you know, as, as Scott mentions here, that uh, it was originally designed in Tasmania, so it has a real cool temperature requirement. Having said that, it has a completely different mode of action to the answer. It just gets in there and eats it all up. It doesn't like being sprayed really hard, as you know. hates high pressures and nozzles and shingling. doesn't like that at all doesn't like Mancazette as we all know, but um, if you put it out preventatively where there's no disease, it literally has no food and so it would be largely ineffective. So I come from the Adelaide Hills, got a farm there, so I want to just use an example. I've got netted vineyards and we put nets on around Verizon, which I know you don't do here. Unless you've got early expression of botrytis, I can't use, I can't use trichoderma. I'd love to, but unless I've got disease, I can't. And if, I get, if I've got disease at Verizon, I'm in a bit of trouble. So I would probably go with Botecta there, so it buy me time, put the lid on. But if I want to, uh, it might be a better alternative, but if I want to use, what I would really probably use would be Serenade Optic, which is a great storming option, but it only gives me coverage for five to seven days. So, uh, if I think I'm going to get hold of it, uh, for, you know, uh, before I net, then I would. But I would most likely, um, uh, if I have existing infection, and I'm guessing it wouldn't be early, I would go with a Serenade Opti. If I had um, go, grapes going to a corporate winery and I couldn't go with Trichoderma, and uh, I would consider Botecta again probably, as long as I was A and B grade fruit, and I was going to be hanging for longer than 10 days. If I was less, I would just go with Serenade. And part of that example, well, hopefully that sort of explains matching the mode of action with, um, with a particular product. So can I, just, I can just urge you just to uh, um, find out more or speak to your advisors more about what the modes of action of these particular products have gone. There's a vineyard um, just on the other side of the creek. It's a Jura vineyard owned by, not far from Newman's there, and they, they leave it hanging for quite some time. I think they leave it hanging to 16, is that right? So I had a look at it last year. It needed Serenade Opti. It didn't need Botecta because it was quite late, had existing effect, and it was better to just knock it, knock it down. And that's really another really good example. We had more time. Um, uh, Botecta is a little bit more expensive. Um, and uh, more hang time, definitely, you know, something like that.
Yeah? Um, just going to your point about this CFU, another important thing for these guys to look at is if it's in milliliters or liters, because Serenade actually um, label theirs in, in per, uh, I think it's 10 to the 12 per litre, and then some other companies do it as per milliliter. And that makes That's a really difference. important point, yeah. And, and really, as we were discussed, it doesn't really make much difference at all. And uh, because it's uh, so sensitive in terms of UV light, so that's, it is a really good point. And, and, and the, analogy, the analogy I use with different strains, so what you're saying is there's a lot of different strains do different things, and it's like, I'll, I'll just try to simplify it a bit, like with dogs, like you have, you know, a sheepdog's different to a Jack Russell, and a Doberman's different to a, you know, like, so different strain, like it can, like a Greyhound can run a hundred faster than a, than a um, Jack Russell, which can retrieve a fox out of a, out of a whole bed. So I'm just saying bacillus and different strains of microbes do different functions differently uh, for some of them. For sure. Yeah, so so with, when, you, when you buy a Botecta, you buy a fungal solution, not a bacterial solution, it's a fungus. Yeah. And uh, when you mix up in solution you apply, it populates uh, micro scratches, holes, entry points, competitively um, excludes the um, Botrytis pathogen from uh, its food source. And that's all it does. And once that, and uh, so I want this product to work really quickly. So I want to apply it and then have it really aggressively uh, populate those holes and micro scratches. And then it fills over uh, and forms a sort of a, a scab, if you like, an exudate. So it's called Orobacidium pululans. The Orobacidium is the fungus, the pululans is this scab that it forms over the, uh, and, and that will never, the botrytis will never get in. And this is a really good example. So that little circled area, the little micro scratches, and you can see on the right, the um, um, botrytis uh, mycelium starting to invade that micro scratch. So this competitive exclusion is, this is a perfect example. So um, the Botecta is in the yellow and the pathogen is in the blue. And you can see as you go across the screen, um, the uh, uh, Botecta is actively filling up that, um, uh, that micro scratch or that light brown apple moth chew or that um, you know, berry expansion um, stretch and scratch or a uh, injury from pruning machine or a leaf plucking or something like that and it will uh, competitively exclude the pathogen from getting in. And once, but if, <clears throat> once that's sealed over and protected, then uh, the pathogen won't get in. If another micro scratch comes, uh, or another incident, or the berries expand you know, for another reason, um, then it will need to be reapplied at some point. So, so this is what it actually looks like. So this was done, um, uh, this is some Scott stuff, and this is, you can see on the surface there, you can see those little clear spots. That's where the, um, the Orosidium pululans, the protector, is actually colonising a micro scratch on that berry that we can't see. And uh, I don't know if you can see it really well. So that's exactly what it looks like out in the field. I love this slide, and I love it for one reason only. It just demonstrates um, the importance, as Scott puts it, the importance of population management and, and working the population down, taking the pressure off those actives that we're going to be losing over, uh, over time uh, <clears throat> so to a manageable level uh, so they can perform better. And uh, so in this particular trial, we've got untreated control on the left. It's percent in incidence of botrytis in Caradar, which is that block south, that area south of Margaret River gets very wet, very very, lots of sea fog and quite heavy dews, etc, etc. So the middle treatment is Botecta with 100 grams per 100 litres at pre-bunch closure and Verazon. Nothing else, just those two treatments. No Teldor, no switch, no Prolactus, nothing. And the third is Botecta at flowering, pre-bunch closure and Verazon only. So it just demonstrates beautifully the impact uh, of this product in terms of competitive exclusion, protecting those entry points, keeping uh, the Botrytis food source away from the pathogen. I think that's pretty cool. Now, complicated slide, but I just want you to, uh, just, there's four, we really stuffed this up when we released this product a couple of years ago. There were a lot of people that walked away from our meetings thinking it had to be applied 
at each of these key timings uh, in order for it to work. And we really stuffed it up. And the point is, it doesn't. Uh, it, these are suggested timings depending on what's happening in the vineyard. And this is where AJ's school will improve over the next two or three years if we, you know, if we uh, ever get disease again. But I mean, if we're ever faced with this situation, this product um, will be a tool for him to use um, as, and it will be for yourself. So, and as an example, 80% catfall. So what it does is it competes with the botrytis where those caps, where those cap scars are. And so it does have a role in reducing latent infection. So there's some work that Sadi are doing with, um, uh, with uh, Utipa scars as well from, as, a, as a way of excluding the pathogen um, from uh, existing scars. So there's some work being done in Sadi with that. So that's a suggested timing for that reason, to reduce that latent infection. And that would be, in our country, only you know, in really high risk blocks. The EL31, of course, um, coming just before the brunch closure, you know, there's a lot, they have a lot of light brown anthemoth over there. Your sealing wound sites and, uh, sorry, those words are a bit small. Sealing wound sites, you know, um, <coughs> as a result of, as the botrytis loads improved, plus also those micro scratches are starting to be formed. Sometimes there's also some light brown anthemoth around that time where they've been chewing their entry points as well. So it has a, and it has a, um, a role there. Uh, the raison or berry softening, of course, at 35, doing pretty much the same thing. And they're the main targets during that scent. And then at 35 to 38 during ripening, obviously sending wound sites once again, um, treating split berries, and particularly that secondary spread that we get that we would expect at that timing. Um, and a really good example of that is this trial. And this trial, it just was done in Strathbogie, uh, which is sort of east, northeast of Melbourne, right at the base of the Great Dividing Range, so really quite bad in terms of botrytis. So this was 2017, this is in year one. Um, so I love this slide because it shows a couple of key things. Firstly, those first four treatments, including the untreated control, uh, show that uh, regular applications of botrytis at those four timings that I mentioned, um, treatment two, three, and four, um, reduce the botrytis load significantly in that block. And, uh, but the one I really like is the last two treatments. Um, where you've got Teldor and Switch um, as the second to last treatment on the, on the right uh, at, their two, at their critical timing. So they would have gone out at 80% cat full and a P size. Um, and then you can see the last treatment.